I'm Paul Peterson. I'm the director of the program on education policy and governance at Harvard University. And the program, along with the journal Education Next, does a poll every year and has done so for the past 10 years. So we have a decade's worth of information about public opinion on a variety of issues. And we can trace how opinion has changed over the years on many issues. Um, and we're going to get to that today. And we're going to talk about uh, a lot of really interesting things. But I'm not going to go into that in detail at this point because uh, I want to, first of all, uh, introduce to you our uh, keynote speaker to place this polling information in some kind of a larger context. And uh, we have Michael Barone, who's a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, as uh, our uh, keynote speaker who uh, can do this work very well. He's a political analyst and journalist. He studies politics, American government, campaigns, and elections. We have an, uh, uh, an election going on right now as we speak. Uh, some of you may not know this, but uh, and it's uh, a quite exciting one, I must say. So uh, Michael, you will be expected to identify who exactly is going to win uh, at the presidential level and, and at the Senate level, if you wish. Uh, we'll take that burden off you, but please join us. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak about uh, a subject about which I'm more of an amateur than a professional observer, which is education. Um, having attended uh, various schools in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the uh, the uh, you, we've, as you mentioned, we have a presidential election going on, and we have. Uh, uh, two candidates um, who have their own particular strengths, I suppose, uh, and uh, who are both members of the baby boom generation. And what I like to say about the baby boom generation, um, they're, they're sort of the leading edge of the baby boom generation. If Donald Trump wins this election, we will have th three presidents who were born in calendar year 1946. We've never had three presidents born in the same calendar year. Um, and that's sort of counted as the leading edge of the baby boom generation. Uh, my own observation on this is that the go there's good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that the baby boom generation is eventually going to die out. Uh, it's taken a while, but it's going to happen. Uh, the bad news is that I'm going to die about the same time. So uh, this is... Uh, this is this is what we're facing here. The uh, you, you mentioned that I've had a career in a variety of professions. I'm among other things a recovering uh, professional pollster, um, and in the course of my career, I have gone from one profession to another. Each one of which tends to pay less than the one before, and tends to have a lower degree of intellectual honesty and integrity. <laughs> So I've started off high with law, and then I went down to political consulting, and then I took kind of a jump downwards to journalism. And that leaves only one alternative, which is academia. Uh, and uh, so you've asked me to look over uh, the Education Next polling on, on education, which uh, you've been doing intensively for the last 10 years. And, uh, have done to some extent before that, and of course there's been other polling, and uh, people have been asking questions about education nationally. Uh, pollsters have been for a long time, going back to the Nation at Risk uh, uh, report issued in 1983, uh, which some of us thought was going to solve all the problems in education or lead to their solution. We're still working on that 33 years later. Uh, and uh, to look at that, and to to, uh, and what I see in this polling is um, a sort of constant tension uh, between uh, what people, and in, in these, this polling that you've done has uh, 
has focused on the general public, but also on parents of school-aged children and on teachers by using um, oversamples of those groups so that you've got statistically accurate representation of those uh, because of their uh, presumed particular interest uh, in and knowledge of the subject. And um, there's a tension between what people think about when they focus on what's closest to them personally and between what they think when they try to focus on the subject in a wider and a national perspective. Uh, and one common example that we think, and you see the result in your 2016 polling, uh, is that uh, uh, Fifty-five percent of the respondents give their local schools a grade of A or B, uh, and only 25 percent give the nation's schools as a whole a grade of A and B. Now, you can say those are intellectually consistent responses. You know, we've chosen the school our kids go to, our local, local schools, and that's why they're good, and these other schools are no good. But there's clearly a different perception of what's going on uh, with what people see close to them personally and what they see uh, in the nation's whole. And I think, I think that's a result related to what I call, uh, uh, and perhaps uh, the people who have greater expertise in education in this room would, would take issue with this, the sort of industrial model of public schooling, uh, the model adopted really over the last hundred years in this country in which uh, sees schools, uh, you know, the old progressive uh, education movement, which dates back, what, a hundred years just about uh, at this point. Um, and if it had only been confined within the precincts of Columbia Teachers College, but uh, it spread, uh, is, is uh, the industrial model of public school, which they sort of models schools on factory assembly lines with interchangeable parts, with experts at the top setting uh, the supposed standards, ideas, uh, in which uh, individuals have to um, report to assign stations in the assembly line, to assign factories, to assign places, uh, depending uh, typically on your place of residence. Um, and uh, so within that setting, people tend to uh, rate local schools uh, highly in part, uh, because uh, one factor that people who are parents or prospective parents take into account when they choose where to live is uh, what the local schools are like. Uh, when you're buying a house or an apartment, you are also buying, you're paying tuition for a local public school to which a child is entitled uh, to enter uh, at that stage under the industrial model. And people take that into account. And when you look at... Uh, housing prices, and particularly housing prices in areas where the housing tends to be housing for families as opposed to singles, uh, they're pretty responsive to uh, school uh, uh, outcomes. I mean, you look at, uh, I looked at one of those things on the internet, you know, the 15 highest SAT score high schools or something like that. A lot of them are in suburban New York metro area. You look at housing prices in those districts. And basically, uh, what you're paying for the house represents something like tuition to Andover uh, <laughs> when you're buying that, you know, and your property taxes uh, represent that. People tell me that they move out of Chappaqua, New York, because uh, once their kids graduate from high school, they can't afford the property taxes anymore. It operates like tuition. Uh, at a, um, a boarding elite boarding school, uh, but people that's one of the factors um, you know why uh, is uh, why are property values low in the city of Detroit? Well, uh, one reason is that uh, there is some uh, rumors about that the public school quality is not very high in the Detroit public schools. Um, you could see it in other statistics too. I noticed the other day that there's something like 40,000 children in Detroit public schools. Uh, I entered Detroit public school kindergarten in 1949. There were 250,000 kids in that public school system. That was the old industrial model concentrated in central cities run by downtown people that had education PhDs and presumably uh, sort of an expertise in that. Uh, and you had, I suspect, a much larger percentage of 
the nation's children in those large uh, central city public schools uh, than you have today. Uh, you know, the, the numbers have gone down very drastically uh, in many central cities, I think probably less so in New York City in many ways than many other cities um, where the population has been dwindling. Washington, D.C. is another example where you have many fewer kids in there uh, and you have many more in the suburban districts. Um, and when, um, when I try to generalize uh, and perhaps overgeneralize about the trends in the last 10 years of Education Next polling results, what I see is that I think I see Americans are pulling back from looking at things in a national perspective and are increasingly looking at education in the personal or local perspective. Uh, I think that we're seeing the move from uh, national perspective and and making uh, judgments based on principle and moving more towards the personal perspective and making judgments based on interests. Um, and we see something like that, for example, in the changing responses on the different types of attempts to improve on the industrial model education, on elements of choice, standards and accountability, uh, and teacher improvement. Uh, on choice, uh, charter schools remain very pop wide degree of popularity. 65% of the public supports them. Uh, they do somewhat better among Republicans, 74% than Democrats, 58%. But when you consider that a lot of Democratic politicians really don't like uh, charter schools and see them as an enemy of their teacher union allies, um, you got to say 58% support from Democrats, pretty high. Uh, that's you know, pretty solid majority. Uh, and uh, I think part of the reason for charter schools is that for many respondents, um, they're still looking, they're, there's not much of a personal perspective here. Uh, according to uh, Education Next, we've got just 6% of students attend charter schools nationally. Uh, and uh, after the first charter school was opened in 1992, I mean, many of us have kept up with charter schools, with operations like KIPP, with the New York, uh, with the Success Academies and things in New York City. Uh, you've had high charter percentages in certain central city districts in New Orleans, obviously after Katrina, here in Washington, D.C., uh, and in, in my aforementioned hometown of Detroit. Um, but that's not where most parents are anymore. It's not where most citizens are anymore. Those of us who are concerned about improving education for those who come from the most disadvantaged uh, segments of society are very concerned about this. Um, and other people just sort of like the idea and they think it's okay. Uh, but they, uh, it, it's not as personal an issue to them. Uh, and you see something very different when you start talking about vouchers. Uh, uh, Voucher-supported students may not be all that much more numerous than charter school attenders, uh, but we've seen a big decline in support for charter schools, um, for targeted voucher, or not for charter schools, for vouchers. Support for targeted vouchers uh, that is targeted on uh, kids at risk or disadvantaged uh, students um, from disadvantaged households. Uh, has declined from 55% in 2012 to 43% in 2016. That's way down from, um, uh, that's considerably lower than the support we saw for charter schools. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it's interestingly, we've got, it's currently supported more by Democrats, 49% of Democrats, only 37% of Republicans. Um, this is obviously contrary uh, to the positions that tend to be held by each party's office holders. Uh, and I think it represents uh, personal perspectives uh, governing opinion more uh, than national principles. Uh, you've got, uh, yeah, it, when you look at what, what Democrats are supporting charter schools, uh, targeted vouchers, uh, you see black and Hispanic uh, Democrats who people who identify overwhelmingly as Democrats rather than Republicans, uh, who can envisage children in their neighborhoods or people, children of people that they know or uh, are close to uh, benefiting from these schools. And, you know, if you look at the applicants 
uh, for some of these things and the you know the voucher movement starting uh, in Milwaukee and with Polly Williams uh, um, whom I interviewed in her home one winter day and I had to she had she had all these uh, you know sort of bundled up closed it, it, it gets cold in Milwaukee and sort of extra insulation to keep the cold air from coming into the house um, and uh, that that support has got more Democrats. Uh, Republicans, opponents of targeted vouchers, I suspect they include many people uh, who purchased homes in those upscale suburbs, uh, you know, the Chappaqua, Sias, the Short Hills, um, what, Wyndham, New Hampshire, places where you've got uh, expensive public schools and high property taxes to pay for them. Um, as a sort of substitute for uh, Andover or St. Paul's uh, tuition. Uh, and uh, they're not, you know, uh, they don't like to say so out loud, but they're really not looking forward to an influx of central city kids supported by vouchers coming into their local schools. That's not what they paid their high uh, housing values and pay their high property taxes for. Um, tuition tax credits. Uh, in contrast to vouchers, gain widespread support. 65% uh, of the public, uh, even 47% of teachers. Um, the particulars of this proposal, I think, don't strike home. It's this is kind of a remote thing. Should some corporation or individual get tax credits? Well, I think a lot of voters say, yeah. If you you know, um, if if they're doing anything aside, you know, less noxious than making napalm bombs, they should have tax credits. Uh, that's okay with me. Uh, it's, you know, no skin off my back. Uh, but it's, uh, so I, I think that's a more abstract uh, kind of issue and farther away from people's lives. Uh, testing is another way that uh, people, including many, uh, all of the people in this room have been trying to improve uh, industrial model education. Um, and we see here that uh, in the abstract, 80% uh, of adults are supporting uh, annual reading and math testing from third to eighth grade with at least some testing in high school. Um, and two thirds support using the same standards across the 50 states. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a major consensus, at least when you state the issue in abstract terms. Um, and reflects support indeed for, I would say, for the model of the No Child Left Behind legislation of 2001 to 2. And the, I always find it difficult to say when it was enacted because Congress voted for it in 2001, but President Bush didn't sign it till 2002. So, writing my almanac of American politics, when do you say it became law? It's irritating. I wish to heck they could have done it in the same year, calendar year, and it just saved me some trouble. But anyway, um, the uh, uh, it's really the model of no child left behind and carried on farther uh, uh, when they're doing this. Uh, Seventy percent oppose letting parents opt their children out of taking such tests. That's a pretty broad consensus too. Um, it breaks down, however. Uh, when mention is made of the one set of national standards currently proposed, Common Core. Um, and uh, if there's somebody from the Gates Foundation here, uh, this is bad news uh, for uh, what are clearly very well-intentioned efforts uh, to improve American life. Uh, but Common Core support has been plummeting 90% in 2012. It goes down to 83% the next year, 58% in 2015, and 50% in 2016. Um, the, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a huge decline. Um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a sharp partisan split here at well, as well. Uh, in 2016, the most recent surveys, which were taken, I believe, in May and June of this year, uh, it was the Common Core was supported right in the midst of, you know, primary season after Donald Trump cinched the Republican nomination in the uh, May 3rd Indiana primary, and uh, Hillary Clinton was fighting with Bernie Sanders, uh, but clearly going to win. Um, that uh, 
Sixty percent of Democrats supported Common Core. Only thirty-nine percent are Republicans. Um, it's uh, you know this in some ways this looks like people take looking at this from a national perspective, uh, with Republicans following the lead of some Republican politicians, conservative pundits, uh, or the leading theoretical philosophers of our time, radio talk show hosts. Uh, the uh, my sense is something like the opposite has been happening. This uh, rebellion uh, also kind of arises up from the grassroots, that there's a suspicion uh, among many uh, people, many parents and many non-parents, former parents, uh, or parents whose children have grown up, um, that uh, people, uh, a sort of fear on the part of the more conservative half of the population that any form of national standards will tend to undermine uh, their values and the values of many children's parents. That there's a suspicion that whoever the national leaders of these things are, uh, they're going to be against us and they're going to be for what Manhattan and San Francisco want and not for what um, you know, Texas and North Dakota want, or whatever the comparison is that you want to make there. Uh, I think there's a natural tendency on the part of cultural conservatives uh, to see, to be suspicious of uniform national standards. And I think with uh, the line of talk and things that we've seen uh, and the arguments that have gone on, um, that innate tendency towards suspicion has matured into uh, something like. Uh, fairly spirited opposition to Common Core, to what is labeled as Common Core, what is believed to be in Common Core. Um, and so I think that that's uh, a factor that we're dealing with and uh, the project of trying to uh, use Common Core as a national standard and as uh, a kind of uniform policy I think is in grave risk of failing if to the extent that it depends on public opinion because you've got a large amount of public opinion that's now arrayed against it. Um, and, you know, I hesitate to make any forward predictions, including those for November 8th, but uh, especially those for November 8th. But I um, have to ask President Romney about that. But the, uh, uh, but the, the uh, it seems to me that you're, you know, you, it would be hard to put this Humpty Dumpty back together again, uh, and that that's the kind of enterprise that Common Core is getting. It's become a partisan or culturally divisive issue. Um, looking at this in a longer perspective, uh, I can remember, um, you know, half a century ago, um, you had uh, the the whole idea of you know we're gonna we're gonna improve education. Uh, by increasing spending. And that idea was pushed largely in the states. It was pushed in the proposals for federal aid to con uh, federal aid to education in Congress, which was passed in 1965, 51 years ago, uh, by a coalition of teachers' organizations. They weren't generally labeling themselves as unions in those days. The National Education Association in the 19 early 1960s wasn't I believe, calling itself a union uh, at that time, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and by voters who expected that we get better educational outcomes. You spend more money, you get better results. That was the general assumption, and it's the basis on which many candidates for office, uh, a lot of them Democrats, some Republicans as well, um, campaign on. Um, and uh, I think, again, you see, some, uh, you see some similar alliances today, but I think there's some tension within them. Um, the Education Next 2016 poll found 61% uh, in favor of increased per pupil expenditures. Hey, let's spend more money, you know. That solved everything in Newark. Um, but, well, when, when you inform people of how much spending they were, uh, the, the, they were getting in the district or the state that they were in, uh, that number fell from 61 to 45 percent. Uh, 65 percent favored increased teacher pay. Hey, that fell to 41 percent when they were told what current pay was. Uh, it seems that a lot of Americans have an image of education being starved of money 
and of uh, teachers being uh, given, you know, slightly above minimum wage level salaries, uh, that simply is uh, is out of date, or at least not in line with uh, current facts and statistics. Uh, and so you see, uh, the respondent their their uh, guesses of actual people spending were 44 percent below actual. That's a big miss, fire. Uh, I mean, it's kind of an abstract number per pupil expenditure. It's not something the ordinary person thinks about uh, in the course of going about her or his daily life. But uh, that's a big change. Estimate of teachers' salaries were 30 percent below the average in their states. Uh, so people have got the image of you know teachers making uh, not that much money and you know uh, getting on their food stamps when they go to the grocery store. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case. I note that in some of uh, the uh, confrontations between uh, teacher union members and uh, Governor Chris Christie, um, who many of you will remember before he went into Trump detention camp, uh, the uh, now well he'd make a point of saying, well, if you're making eighty-six thousand dollars. Why are you complaining? He brought the number out, and I think he did so out of an instinct that the ordinary person thought the teacher wasn't making $86,000. They thought she was making 36000 And so he put the number up there. And to most people, even in New Jersey, 86000 sounds like, hey, pretty good salary. It's sure not poverty level, um, and so forth. So um, the uh, one of the things I see uh, when the when we turn to focus on what the opinions are among teachers is that um, teachers these days seem to be lukewarm at best on alternatives to industrial model education. At least that's the perspective that I take from this. Uh, you've only got 52 percent of teachers supporting uh, regular teaching uh, uh, yearly math and reading testing. Uh, the uh, the opposition to allowing parents to opt out has gone down uh, to 57 percent. In both cases, they're less welcoming of testing, very much less welcoming or less likely to be than are the general public or parents. Um, you've only got 20 percent of teachers favoring merit pay. Uh, they like the old industrial model. Everybody working on the assembly line gets the same amount of bucks per hour. We don't want management showing favoritism or speeding up the line or rewarding apple polishers. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that seems, that's favored by 60 percent of the public, only 20 percent of the teachers. The teachers, I, I would submit, are seeing this uh, not from the point of view of national principle, at least not the same response in as the public is, which is seeing this from a national source of principle, since most of them aren't teachers, uh, but from personal interest. And personal interest is uh, they like uh, not having the merit pay. 76% uh, of teachers think that teacher unions have a generally positive effect on schools. Um, that's a view shared by 65% of Democrats, but only 31% of Republicans. Teacher unions have become identified as a pretty partisan force in our society, and I think fairly so. Um, and uh, the, basically, uh, you, you, uh, teachers, I think, are basically accepting of and not in rebellion against uh, this model of employment with, uh, uh, you know, merit, uh, pay not allowed, uh, where you have uh, high security, where you have uh, salary and wage and retirement benefits geared towards uh, people who are making a lifetime career out of teaching uh, and uh, severely um, disincentivizing people to make short-term careers, five, two, five, ten-year commitments uh, to the profession. Uh, you're, you're incentivizing people to stay in and you're reducing accountability. Uh, and um, they, like, they like tenure and they don't like accountability. Uh, I wrote a, uh, a book some years ago called Hard America, Soft America, where I published in 2004, where I said hard America was the part of American life where you have a competition and accountability, and soft America is the part of American life where you have very little competition and accountability. 
Uh, we all, or most of us, recognize that you get more productivity, more creativity, more adaptability uh, if people are in operating in hard America. Um, you know, the highly uh, uh, competitive uh, higher education, the military, uh, large parts of the private sector. Uh, you get less uh, creativity, less um, uh, productivity, less adaptability in soft America where people have tenure and no accountability. On the other hand, most of us in our own life would kind of like a soft America position, uh, <laughs> you know, given the choice. Uh, we would like to have those guarantees. We like to have the idea that, uh, you know, if I just put in 18 years, uh, six months, 41 days, and uh, 12 and a half minutes, I will be getting my pension. It will be 90 percent of my salary. It will never be re reduced and so forth. Uh, the people involved in that like that model, and uh, that uh, that model continues to appeal to teachers, uh, as as it did in the uh, the nation at risk years. That was that was published 33 years ago. There's probably not a huge overlap of people who were actively teaching public schools uh, or in schools generally in 1983 and today. There's some overlap and. There's an incentive for people to make lifetime careers. Uh, but the attitudes of uh, the teachers uh, have continued to be uh, relatively similar and to embrace uh, what I would call the industrial model of, uh, of, 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 of education. Um, as I look back on the history, and again, many of you have more knowledge of this than I do, uh, the progressives who established the industrial education model a century ago uh, wanted a system that would treat uh, students from different backgrounds and those who say that, you know, America has always been sort of white bread and culturally unified and only now has become culturally diversified are dead wrong. The America of a hundred years ago with the immigrants that we had from the Ellis Island period and so forth was at least as culturally diverse as the uh, America that we have today. Um, the, um, they, wanted to, they wanted to prepare themselves to take, uh, take their place in the giant industrial organizations of the time. You had the view of society that was like uh, John Kenneth Galbraith presents in, in the uh, Industrial State book in 1967 that uh, Basically, big organizations were going to account for an increasing percentage of employment, a increasing percentage of the economy. Small organizations, businesses, or public sector, small organizations weren't going to matter much. It was all the big, big units were the important things. And this was fortified in World War II, which was seen as, with considerable uh, accuracy, as a triumph of big government, big business, and big labor, the big units. Got great prestige from that. Uh, and so the, um, the, the big unit view of society, the industrial model of education, I think gained prestige in those years after World War II. That's when we saw the peak populations in central cities, uh, both in terms of total number of residents and also in those big central city school districts, the industrial model. Um, and, uh, but in the years since, uh, American society uh, has become uh, more dispersed across uh, city and suburban lines. Um, we have, uh, while embracing a, a at least surface cultural uniformity in those years after World War II, when the immigrants seem to have been assimilated and so forth, has become, once again, as it was 100 years ago, culturally diverse. Uh, and um, those of us who think that the uh, who have been saying since Nation at Risk, at least, that the uh, system was producing unnecessarily mediocre results and was particularly shortchanging those who come from the most disadvantaged backgrounds um, are trying to introduce choice, uh, rigor, and accountability. Uh, I think that what the, the results of this poll show is that the public uh, continues to favor some policies, but not all policies that would tend to produce more choice, more rigor, more accountability. Uh, teachers tend to resist this, uh, but that the public support of these ideas uh, varies. 
uh, and has in some ways been reduced over the last uh, 10 or a dozen years. Uh, as we've moved from, as people have moved from looking at a national perspective and adopt uh, supporting policies based on principle and looking at a personal, looking at things from a personal and local perspective uh, and supporting uh, or opposing policies uh, based on per personal interests. So I leave you with that mixed uh, and not perhaps entirely happy perspective. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And no, I'm not going to predict whether Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump is going to win the election. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Michael, uh, for that uh, comprehensive look and framing of the discussion for today uh, with a lot of depth and digging into the specifics of the poll that we're going to give you uh, some uh, PowerPoint slides to sort of let you see some of the specific numbers that he uh, was referring to in that really uh, fascinating uh, discussion of hard America and soft America and exactly where does education fit into that. I think, uh, I think it really sets the stage for the conversation today. Uh, while the panel is coming up, uh, let me just uh, make a couple of remarks, but uh, to keep the uh, program moving forward, why don't the members of the uh, first panel uh, take a position here up on the stage. Uh, while they're doing so, I just want to thank the Hoover Institution for making this uh, fabulous uh, facility available to us uh, and uh, for its support for uh, the uh, Education Next Journal in general, as well as the Fordham uh, uh, Institute's uh, uh, support for, for the journal. And so uh, along with the program on education policy and governance at Harvard. These are the three institutions that support the journal and uh, provide the context within which the uh, poll has been launched over the last 10 years. And I want to say one of the other distinctive things about this poll is something that uh, uh, Michael Barone uh, mentioned, and that is this is not only a nationally representative poll of uh, American adults, it's also a poll of American teachers. We have an oversample of teachers in the poll so that we can tell you uh, fairly uh, accurately what teachers are thinking uh, on the same issues that we're talking about the public. And I think that's one of the special, um, ed, in fact, it's unique. There is no other poll out there that is doing that kind of uh, 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 survey of both teachers and the public on the same uh, exact topics. Um, so um, to, uh, at this point, though, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to the chair of the first panel, uh, Matthew Chingos, uh, an old friend who is now at the Urban Institute, where he is a senior fellow and who is studying a wide range of education policy questions in higher education and in K-12 education as well. So uh, Matt, it's yours. Uh, good morning. I'm pleased to be chairing our first panel uh, this morning on accountability and uh, teacher policy. Uh, to start us off, uh, uh, Professor Martin West from the Harvard Graduate School of Education is going to give us a brief uh, overview of some of the really fascinating findings um, on this topic area of accountability and teacher policy from the, the 10 years that Education Next has been, been doing this poll. I kind of want to echo what what Paul said that, you know, the really nice thing about this poll is it gives you some hard evidence. When people say teachers think, they actually have a nationally representative sample of, of what teachers think at, at different points in time. Um, and um, Marty's presentation is going to be followed by some uh, commentary and then a panel discussion by, by an excellent group of, of panelists who we're lucky to have with us today, um, including uh, Michael Petrilli, who's the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, uh, Celine Coggins, who's the founder of Teach Plus, um, and Mary Catherine Ricker, who is the executive vice president of the American Federation of uh, Teachers. So I'd recommend you look at their, their bios or in your, your program. Um, but let's have Marty take it away. Thanks, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my job is to just provide an overview of some of the highlights from this year's poll uh, results related to the issues of accountability and teacher policy. Um, and uh, then turn it over to the panel to make sense of them. 
Um, the Education Next survey, as Paul and Matt have mentioned, has been conducted for a decade now. So with this year's release, we really wanted to call attention to that by trying to uh, share some evidence on trends in public opinion over that time period. Uh, it's distinguished as well, as Matt mentioned, by having a nationally representative sample of teachers in addition to adults in nine of those 10 years. The 2016 survey, which was recently released, was conducted in May and June of this year, had a total of roughly 4,200 respondents, uh, and seven that includes 707 teachers. Um, that's quite a large sample and would actually be wasteful from a survey research perspective. One of the reasons why we draw such a large sample, however, is so that we can actually conduct a lot of experiments within the context of our poll. So by presenting questions or issues to uh, respondents in different ways, we can learn about how uh, the provision of information or the use of specific terms influences their views, the views that they express, while still having a large enough sample to characterize the um, views of those seeing a, a particular version of a question. Um, so as I said, we're focusing a lot on trends in public opinion this year. And as we do so, in order to simplify the presentation, we focus on the share of respondents among those who take a position on an issue who express support for the position that we're asking about. That is, we exclude those who take the neutral position on the survey, that is, neither supporting nor opposing the policy we're asking about. We make, of course, the full results with the neutral position available on our website, educationnext.org. Um, but this really simplifies the presentation by allowing us to characterize public opinion with just a single number and make it easier to look at trends in support over time. Um, none of the claims that we make uh, about either the direction of changes in t over time or the sort of balance of opinion or differences of, of opinion between different subgroups among respondents uh, are sensitive to that decision about how we present the data. Um, the other thing I should note briefly is that the placement of the neutral position within our response options for uh, survey participants changed in 2013. And so we urge you to be cautious. We try to be cautious as well in interpreting changes in opinion at that point in our survey's history. Um, I'm going to be talking very briefly now about some key results related to standards, testing, and accountability, teacher policies, and teachers' unions. Uh, we'll try and focus the discussion of this panel on those topics. And then my colleague Paul Peterson will be covering some other issues with a particular emphasis on school choice in the second panel. So let me dive in with the uh, topic of the Common Core. Um, the, uh, this is the question we've been using to ask about support for the Common Core over the past several years. As you may know, in the last few years, states have been deciding whether or not to use the Common Core, which are standards for reading and math that are the same across the states. Uh, in the states that have these standards, they'll be used to hold public schools accountable for their performance. Do you support or oppose the use of the Common Core standards in your state? And the red line is through those words in the question because uh, this is one of those cases where we conducted an experiment. Not everyone saw the question with the words Common Core. Uh, and some of them saw them with them omitted, both in uh, the sort of setup to the question as well as when we ask about support. And it makes a difference in terms of what you find. Um, so this is a picture of the survey results over time. And there are a few things to pay attention to here. One, most obviously, the support uh, for Common Core specifically is on the left-hand side of the slide. And what you see is that there's just been a dramatic uh, decline in support for Common Core since 2012 when we began asking about it, going from overwhelming, uh, essentially universal 90% support for the Common Core among the general public all the way down to 50% and even split in 2016 for the first time. You see that this downward trend is pervasive across different uh, subgroups. We see blue Democrats and red Republicans there, uh, as well as uh, the green line uh, indicating the views of teachers. We see teachers and Republicans sort of shifting away from the Common Core first, um, but you see Democrats trending downward steadily over this time period as well between 2012 and 2016. Um, you also see a downward trend when you ask the question about same standards, uh, but support for same standards remains quite strong overall at 
more than 65% among the general public. Um, just to show you specifically how sort of that experiment plays out for different members of the public. For the public as a whole, uh, if you ask about the Common Core specifically, you get 42% support. Uh, now reporting the data uh, just um, sort of as a fraction of the uh, all respondents, including those who remain neutral. Um, you see that jumps 13 percentage points when you just ask about the same standards. Um, that language effect, which I think highlights the extent to which sort of Common Core has become a tainted brand, while support for the uh, underlying concept of similar standards remains strong, is largest among Republicans, as you might expect, 35% uh, to 53%, an 18 percentage point gap in support for Republicans, depending on which version of the question you ask. But it's also evident for Democrats and teachers as well. I should say we saw a very similar pattern of results with respect to No Child Left Behind in the waning years of the Bush administration, where when we asked about key components of No Child Left Behind, the public was strongly supportive. But when we used the words No Child Left Behind to characterize them, we found a lot of opposition. And that this was particularly true in that case for Democrats rather than Republicans. So I think it tells us something about what happens when a particular set of education ideas comes, or a particular education sort of uh, policy initiative comes to be closely associated with a president uh, who obviously is associated with a particular party. Uh, one of the key issues that Congress faced over the past year was whether to continue to require that students be tested each year in grades three through eight and once in high school, as was the case under No Child Left Behind uh, in the Every Student Succeeds Act. Congress decided to maintain that requirement, but not without a lot of controversy. Um, perhaps one of the reasons they did is actually there's quite broad public support for this annual testing requirement. We had asked about this topic back in the years 2010 to 2012, and we actually stopped asking about it at the time because it was so boring finding that 80% of the public supported it year after year. It didn't seem like the best use of our survey real estate. It became an issue again, and we decided to start asking about it in 2015. You actually don't see much of a change since that earlier period, and because of the sort of change in the survey administration, we're not exactly sure whether that change is real or not. Um, but over the past two years, we've had uh, about 78% of the public expressing support. We here see the first signs of a quite a large difference between the views of teachers and the broader public. Uh, so teachers are more evenly split with only about 52% of teachers who take a position on that issue expressing support. Um, parental opt-out. Uh, this is an issue that we had not asked about before last year because it frankly wasn't a issue. Um, but uh, obviously, it's received a lot of attention over the past couple of years. One of the reasons why Congress was paying attention to whether it should continue to require annual testing. So we asked people whether they supported letting parents decide whether to have their children take state math and reading tests and found actually very limited support for parental opt-out rights among the broader public. Only a quarter of the public supporting, 60% opposing. That was the same in 2015 and in 2016. You see somewhat higher levels of support for this option for parents among parents themselves, uh, something you might expect since we're asking about a, essentially a privilege to be afforded to parents, 38%. Uh, you also see somewhat higher support for parental opt-out among teachers, 40%. Um, but overall, I'd say we were surprised by the limited extent to which parental opt-out has brought, gotten traction with the broader public given the attention that it's received in uh, the media. That being said, it doesn't take all too many parents opting out of state tests in order to really gum up the works when it comes to uh, accountability systems. Turning over to teachers, this year for the first time we asked the public to express their views, to rate the uh, performance of teachers in their local schools using categories similar to those used in new teacher evaluation systems, ranging from excellent to unsatisfactory. Uh, I think we see overall a fairly favorable perspective on teachers' performance with more than half of teachers uh, being assigned excellent or good ratings, but also substantial room for improvement at the bottom. So the general public identifies on average 15% of teachers in their schools as unsatisfactory. Uh, teachers themselves identify 10% of their peers as un 
satisfactory in terms of their performance, that is strikingly higher than what we get even out of reform teacher evaluation systems, which tend to rate only 1% uh, or so of teachers in, uh, uh, as unsatisfactory. Turning to what to do about issues of teacher quality, we've for many years asked about merit pay, just asking very simply, do you favor or oppose basing part of the salaries of teachers on how much their students learn? And we find uh, uh, very strong support for merit pay. Uh, we have about 60% of the general public among those taking opinion, expressing an opinion in support. Um, and that's really true among both Republicans and Democrats who see eye to eye on this issue. Uh, the outlier there, as you can see, is teachers. Only 20% of teachers support the concept of merit pay. And that 40 percentage point difference is the single largest uh, difference between the views of teachers and the general public on any issue that we ask about. We also asked about teacher tenure. Uh, offering them an explanation of what teacher tenure is and then uh, asking the public whether they favor or oppose offering tenure to teachers. Um, and here we see uh, actually quite substantial uh, support for, um, I guess, not giving teachers tenure or uh, this is the share that are supporting the concept of teacher tenure. So you have uh, only about 30% of the public supporting teacher tenure um, and that's at uh, at equal to the lowest that we've seen over the period we've been conducting our survey. Um, and there is something of a partisan divide here, but not a particularly strong one. Uh, again, the big difference is between uh, the views of teachers and the broader public. Um, uh, one of the things we were interested in was the extent to which people's perceptions of the performance of teachers is reflected in their views on policy issues related to teacher policy. And so one of the ways we looked at that was by looking at the individual level at the share of teachers that an individual respondent rated in their local schools as being satisfactory or below. And so I've grouped uh, individuals here based on whether they rated only very few teachers in their local schools as um, satisfactory or below or many more. And what you see Perhaps, expected, uh, perhaps as expected is to the, uh, the more that you see teacher performance as a problem, as indicated by your ratings that you assign, uh, the more likely you are to support merit pay, the more likely you are to oppose teacher tenure, and uh, at the extremes, the less likely you are to support salary increases as a strategy to try to improve teacher performance. Um, and so there is some coherence to the positions that Americans are expressing when it comes to teacher policy. Um, finally, uh, we've asked, as uh, Michael Barone <coughs> noted, uh, people about their views of teacher unions, asking whether they have a generally positive effect on schools or a generally negative effect. Um, and here, we again see uh, quite a substantial gap between the views of teachers and the broader public. Um, about the public is evenly split on the issue of teachers unions uh, with about 49% of those expressing a view one way or the other um, uh, saying that they have a positive effect. Teachers though uh, have become increasingly favorable uh, towards their unions over time with now three quarters of teachers expressing uh, positive views as well. Um, it, there was a period in our decade of survey work in which it appeared that uh, opinion was trending against the uh, teachers' unions, but that's certainly not the case now. And uh, in fact, the public's uh, views on teachers' unions are uh, at a high with respect to the period that we've been conducting our survey work. So this is the point in a talk on these poll results where I would usually turn to the task of trying to make sense of them. Uh, but fortunately, I don't have to do that today because I have three folks who are going to do that hard work for me, uh, and I'll weigh in on anything I hear that I uh, disagree with, but I don't expect to hear much. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel. Good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hi, Mike Petrilli. Uh, great to be with you. First, uh, thanks to Hoover for hosting this and the great partnership on Education Next, this beautiful room and view. Uh, and uh, as well as our friends at Harvard, it's, you know, getting to work 
with the Education Next team is one of the best parts of my job. It really is a joy, again, to work with Paul and Matt and Marty and, and the rest of the team. Uh, so a, a couple of thoughts about these uh, uh, these results. And, and if I get cut off, Matt, I'm just going to start tweeting them. So I'm just saying, you know, you, you can, you can turn off my mic, but you cannot stop me uh, from now. So look, uh, first of all, I think we, we have to remember to put poll results in some context, right? That we don't want to just follow whatever the polls say. There, there's a, a name for doing that. If, you know, somebody who just takes a poll and then adopts positions accordingly, that name is Donald Trump. <laughs> right? I mean, we've seen, right? We have this populist moment, and so here's a candidate who's happy to say, well, let's do a poll and find out that the Republican base cares a lot about immigration. Okay, I'm going to build a wall. Now he's running in the general election. Well, suburban swing voters, women especially, care about child care and the cost thereof. Okay, I'm going to have a policy on that. Uh, you know, what you end up with are policies that maybe one at a time are popular, but they do not add up to any kind of coherent approach. Right. So, um, and we also see that there's, of course, going to be differences uh, that people express when asked about high-level issues, and then when you ask them to dig in and really to see what that may, you know, what would that mean. So, in education, that means you know everybody loves the idea of accountability, but then you start digging in and say, okay, so what about closing low-performing schools? Whoa, 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 whoa! We're not in favor of that, and I think that's natural. That's normal. I think you know, those of us. That, are focused on education. If you, if we did polls on something we don't know a whole lot about, I'll speak for myself, like say foreign policy, you know, I probably, there'd be a lot of contradictions that, you know, I, I want America to avoid going to war, you know, if at all possible. Uh, okay. You know, but should America intervene if there's a horrible human rights violations and children are being slaughtered? Well, yes. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, so there, there's tensions. And so the, the job of policymakers and those of us that, that work in public policies to wrestle with the trade-offs. And, uh, you know, I think it's just always hard to get at that in a poll. And it's not, a, you know, you wouldn't expect everybody to go as deep on these issues uh, and, and have to wrestle with those things. So what we have to do with these polls then is to look for insights uh, and, and try to look for, you know, what, what are people trying to tell us and what are some pieces of common sense that we can take to improve uh, the policies that we're putting forward. So, uh, you know, so again, back to the school closures piece, for example, uh, you know, we, we see from uh, from the PDK poll, from uh, at times from this poll, you know, people express we like accountability. We don't like school closures. Um, well, they're telling us something. And I think we would mostly agree. We would say even those of us who say that at the you know, there should there might be a point where we have to close down low performing schools. Of course, we'd rather try to improve them first. Of course, closing down schools should be a last resort. Uh, similarly, you know, people like teacher accountability, but do we like to fire teachers based on test scores? Well, no. I mean, of course, that doesn't sound good to anybody. Of course, we should have a broader policy. We should make it possible for low perform for, for chronically low performing teachers to be fired, uh, but we shouldn't do so based on test scores alone. Right? When it comes to the teacher data, I think I'd be really curious to hear what our colleagues here have to say. You know, when when teachers say they don't like merit pay. Uh, or they're expressing skepticism. I, I would disagree with Michael Brown a little bit. I, I don't know that it's saying that they like the industrial style model and they like the lockstep. I suspect, if we talk to teachers, is that they don't trust the people in the system to make good judgments uh, about these things. They don't trust you know, their principal, maybe, but they especially don't trust the district bureaucrats or the state bureaucrats to design a system that is fair where it's actually going to be that the best teachers get rewarded and the bad teachers get laid off. They worry that they're a good teacher and somehow they're going to get caught up in this and uh, unfairly. And you know what? They have reason to worry about that because our system is completely, you know, messed up. And so I, I think that, again, we have to be careful how we interpret these results. A few things on Common Core. Uh, almost all of you probably know I'm a big Common Core supporter. I have been, uh, yes, Ashley, thank you. Uh, but I have uh, been, uh, Ashley, who has been tweeting, had tweeted about 20 times today about what these uh, results already mean. You can check that out. But, uh, you know, have been through the Common Core Wars and have some scars uh, to show for it and scuffled cowboy boots from going all over uh, red America uh, trying to defend these things. Uh, look, I, I think we have to keep in mind that the, that brand has been the subject of 
an enormous amount of negative advertising, right? Mostly earned media, right? But negative advertising from those talk radio hosts, uh, from groups like Freedom Works that has used this topic to, you know, sign up voters and 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 raise money, uh, and from candidates, you know, that they you the, from Ted Cruz and many others that would say in the same breath, repeal Obama care, repeal Common Core. You know, I think that we have been lucky in education reform, that some of the other things we care about, like, say, charter schools, uh, have not been the subject to as much negative advertising or connected as closely to a political party. I suspect some of our friends uh, in the AFT may be trying to change that, but, you know, if, if, if mainstream <laughs> Democratic presidential candidates ever got to the point where they regularly attack charter schools, uh, that would be a big problem, and I think you'd start to see the result, uh, you know, support for charter schools drop as well. But the good news for those of us that support high standards and tougher tests and, and all the rest is that they are in place and they look like they're going to stay in place mm -hmm. and they may not be named Common Core and they may get tweaked over time, uh, but uh, they are dramatically better than we had before this whole process. So despite the, the uh, damaged brand, uh, I would argue that it's, it's been worth it. You're All right, right, I'm on. Yeah, Great. Um, hi, my name is Celine Coggins. Uh, I run an organization called Teach Plus. Teach Plus is a teacher leadership organization. Uh, we work with excellent, experienced teachers uh, in urban systems around the country to allow them leadership and growth opportunities that allow them to stay in the classroom and also develop new skills and have expanded influence. One of the pathways that we have in our leadership programming is around uh, policy and helping teachers to learn about policy and get involved in the decisions that affect their classrooms. And so one of the things that I do as a leader at Teach Plus is serve kind of as a broker between policymakers and teachers. And so I'm always looking for entry points uh, in looking for you know, where teachers can influence policy, get listened to, be ahead of some of the tensions that exist between teachers and taxpayers, and assert their vision for solving problems. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is just to do three things real quickly. One is uh, highlight two entry points that I see for teachers to take a lead in painting a vision uh, of what should change from the survey. Second is um, push for a couple of data cuts for uh, the guys who have all of the data. And then third is kind of conclude with the one thing that as someone who's considered somewhat of an expert in this field, I was really surprised by. So in terms of entry points, um, I want to start by highlighting the uptick in support for labor and for unions. Um, we saw that both from uh, teachers and from the general public. Um, in my opinion, and lightning might strike me at Hoover, but I think that's a good thing. Um, I think we need a strong teaching force, and we need teachers to have a voice in how schools operate. However, on the flip side, I have worked in and with uh, top officials at all sorts of different kind of policy making machines. So in state departments of education, uh, working with the commissioner, uh, in districts, uh, and with the federal government. And so I know uh, what happens when those leaders get pressure from both sides. If the general public, that is taxpayers, uh, are pushing in one direction and teachers are pushing in the other, then teachers risk losing ground and risk losing voice. Um, so I see some areas where, uh, where there are those tensions and where teachers and unions with that growing public support could assert themselves as problem solvers and paint a vision for the future. So the two I want to identify are number one, testing. So we see that there is strong public support for testing. Um, we know teachers, uh, you know, by contrast, are frustrated with it. And in places like my state of Massachusetts, um, we have lots of teachers who are leaders in the opt-out movement. I don't think we're going back to a world where we have no idea of achievement gaps and where we throw away testing altogether. And so I think that where, where teachers choose that as the fight, end all testing, they're going to lose power. Uh, I think teachers have, we really need teachers in a different conversation. We really need teachers in the conversation around fixing testing, around making sure there are fewer streamlined tests, around better quality tests, and tests that are aligned to curriculum. So I hope that this data is reinforcement to move in that direction and away from kind of a losing battle around ending testing. The second area where I see an entry point for teacher vision is around pay. So we know that the majority of the informed public doesn't support general pay increases for teachers, but they heavily support merit pay. 
Uh, teachers are just the opposite. We know that they generally seek increased pay, but not in the form of merit pay. <clears throat> so there's a third way solution here, I think, that doesn't pit the interests of the public against the interests of teachers. Um, we work with lots of teachers who, who kind of cringe at the term merit pay, but they're desperately seeking teacher leadership opportunities. So oftentimes I'll say to them, so you mean you want the opportunity to be recognized for your success in the classroom and to get additional pay and responsibility? And they say yes. <laughs> so, you know, Merit Pay, just like Common Core, is a damaged brand. Um, and there is a through way that allows great teachers to grow and develop and be recognized for success um, and, you know, and kind of recognize that public desire for um, taxes to not just go to blanket increases for everyone. A couple of things uh, in terms of uh, new data cuts that I'd love to see, uh, and these correspond with things that, uh, that we've looked at at Teach Plus in our own polling. Uh, number one is looking at the differences between teachers who are earlier in their careers and teachers who are more senior. Uh, so we cut the data oftentimes by teachers with 10 years or less in the profession versus 10 years or more. And we find huge gaps on lots of the issues that we see here, gaps in things like, uh, you know, do you think student performance should be a part of your evaluation? Um, mo generally, in, on topics like that, on topics of accountability, younger teachers are more interested in uh, the system that corresponds more to what the general public is looking for than uh, more senior teachers. The other cut that I'd like to see is uh, teachers in urban communities versus suburban and rural communities. Uh, we work disproportionately in urban communities and see some differences on questions like should there be annual testing. Uh, teachers who work at the heart of the achievement gap um, in poorer communities are much more interested in annual testing as a measure of how we're doing against those achievement gaps than teachers in suburban communities. Finally, um, I'm going to add my biggest surprise. So like I said, I should um, j have a general familiarity with the, these data. And most things in the survey didn't surprise me. Uh, but there was um, one thing kind of deep in the B side <laughs> um, around um, agency fees for teachers and unions. Right. And the, um, the majority of teachers, or so 47%, uh, were not supportive of it, and 42% were, which I found really surprising. I have generally seen in my work, in my experience, uh, the kind of the earlier statistic that more teachers are, uh, are more interested in being a part of their unions. And so that was really surprising to me, and I don't know how to make sense of it. And I'm interested in the conversation. Hey, but thank you so much for having me here today, and I'm actually really excited to be able to um, to be able to react to the polling results a little bit and actually talk about some things that are actually foremost on my mind and sort of on my daily work as well. So my leadership in my union began about a decade ago. Um, and I, I, bring, I, I appreciate a nation at risk being brought up this morning, um, partially because one of the things a nation at risk brought us was the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. And um, earning my National Board certification in 2004 was one of the most satisfying moments of my professional career. And it really guided, it, you know, it, it helped me define what accomplished practice looked like for me in meeting the needs of my students. And it also made me very hungry to, um, to make sure that I could speak about that practice in places where it mattered. Um, and so when I think about, you've been surveying for about a decade, and I've been a leader in my union, so I just by way of background, um, I earned my national board certification in 2004. I actually ran to be president of my local union in 2005. Um, when I earned my national board certification, I didn't know that that was going to happen in the next 18 months um, or so, but um, that was the trajectory I took. And um, and so I feel particularly ready to react to a lot of these findings and even some of the trends. Um, and I do have to say, part of the reason I ran in 2005 to be president of my local union was the lack of teacher voice on these issues in particular um, was largely responsible for why I'm here today and not in a fourth period, seventh grade language arts right now in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, so I have, I have 
my thoughts are a lot more scattered now than they were initially, but I think that's a good thing. Um, Because I want to actually go back to a a question Michael hypothesized, and that is, what are people trying to tell us? And I think any poll, the polls we take at AFT, um, you know, any poll we see on the front page of the paper, certainly this poll too, um, it is a pulse check worth digging into um, while surveying the landscape at the same time. Um, And so when I ask that same question, what are people trying to tell us, it leads me to certainly digging in more and to my own hypotheses based on some of the daily lived experiences I have. Um, You know, so I look at, uh, you know, the uh, sort of the global idea that the demise of school reform has been greatly exaggerated. And and I take issue with it, not so much because um, the because of the issues you polled on, because I think those issues are, are fairly well known. In, in our discourse, um, mostly because that, but I take issue with it mostly because um, the issues you pulled on in my in my daily work uh, seem to be crowded out by the issues I hear about the most. And this actually, I go back to 2005 when I first won my first election as union president, and that actually seems to be the pattern of my experience. You know, I ran on issues of teacher, teaching leadership. Um, and in my local and I was met at like my first day on the job with issues of the rising cost of health care and I was like okay ready to like ready to die or again ready to dig in ready to figure out what are people trying to tell me um, about our students and their families and the experiences they're ha- they're bringing to school and um, and what do I do about that and so I feel like the issues, the issues I am hearing most about and the issues I am digging in most about right now include um, obvious discipline disparities, um, school resource officers, the increase in bullying, particularly in the last six to nine months. Um, Really, I would say in the last four to six years, the issues of bullying have come to the forefront around our um, identified or perceived LGBTQ or other students. Um, That has expanded actually greatly into students um, identified or perceived to be uh, immigrants, students perceived to be the other um, in that category. And certainly the, the debate in the political discourse in the last six months has made, the, I mean, this is something I'm hearing from teachers daily. Can you send me links to how I have these conversations with my students? Can you send me, you know, curriculum material? So we're like sending out share my lesson links and we're sending out, go to Colorado in Colorado and find out what we're saying about how to support unaccompanied refugee children who come to your site, um, come to your community. Um, you know, here's some, you know, here's some resources to, to bring some of the conversation around the movement for black lives into your classroom and um, and so we're, and we're seeing an increased ask for like what are some resources around mental health um, how funding is something that is constant and I and I think it's and again when I ask what are people trying to tell us and I see you know the sort of the conflation of of testing and opt-out I I see there actually being a, a cry and in a conversation around funding that that needs to be included, I, one of the things I'll, I'll point out very often is that annual testing has existed in lots of places for a really long time. Opt out is relatively new. I mean, I I'm sure historically we could find out maybe examples of it in the in the 70s or 80s. I am not versed in that history, but opt out as a sort of as a movement and as a common conversation feels is relatively new, right? In the last um, in the last sort of decade or even half a decade. Uh, and so again, I'm asked to um, like, what are people trying to tell us? And why, you know, so why is there this this change? Um, and and I saw in the last decade this agitation around experiences students deserve being crowded out by additional reading courses and in math courses and so the push out of you know of art or music or physical education or world languages right at the time we realized that those things also help create critical thinking they help see a broader world perspective and and so if we see and and if ESSA can bring this to us, right? If we see a rebalance in in the schools our our children deserve overall, um, 
My hypothesis is that we will see less consternation about annual testing or grade span testing in high schools, um, and we will we will we will see that you know people will start feeling that balance uh, return, and and I think right now that is a it was a it, it's a product partially of of funding concerns that if you feel like you live in a world of limited resources and you know you have so much funding for something and the focus is on reading you're going to see an attempt adding to you know reading teachers at the expense of your art teacher or your music teacher and that's been people's lived experiences and then i would say the other thing in part of my daily experience now too is teachers asking for on help on what ESSA is going to look like in their classrooms. And and I think part of that is just smart. We like to be well prepared, right? We like to have our lesson plan smart. And part of that is also our lived experience as teachers. And I will go back to um, your results on the Common Core State Standards and this lived experience transferring then to what is ESSA going to look like um, in diagnosing why we have um, uh, you know, sort of a lack of support or, or draining support on Common Core state standards. While we see, you know, as we, I, and I have certainly had in the conversations, I think Michael's heard me just talk about common standards. And there's like a different pallor in the room when you <laughs> talk about shared standards or common standards versus the brand of Common Core state standards. And, and again, I think part of it is this lived experience of the lack of any attention to what meaningful professional development would look like in going from whatever your state's common standards were to the adoption of Common Core state standards. And, and we have a responsibility to name that, and I think there are a number of people around ESSA now saying, let's not make some of those same mistakes. Like the, uh, I'll share one story as an example of in the last, I'd say, four years, because I remember this story came from um, one of our, our big professional development seminar every other year, it's called Teach. And a teacher talking to me after going through uh, several of our professional development seminars on adopting the state standards at TEACH, our professional development seminar, and saying, I cannot believe how much better prepared I feel now. Um, I went to an opening week seminar at my school district where I had a 40-minute training Right? They didn't even call it professional development. I had a 40-minute training on the Common Core Standards, and the person at the front of the room literally like did this with her hands and said, and now you know how to teach to the Common Core State Standards. <laughs> And, you know, and I wished that was a rare <laughs> example, but it wasn't. And so, though, you know, and so I, I hear the, again, I hear those lived experiences up against this, and I dig into Michael's question of what are people trying to tell us, and that is that um, we, we need to take those lived experiences and act on those as well. So, again, the, the, the polling can certainly be that pulse check to say what are people trying to tell us. I feel like my job is to pair that with those lived experiences I'm having and then, you know, and then dive in to actually create that, create that improved situation. Thank you. Marty, Thank do you, you want to react to anything before I open it up with a question? Sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just make a couple of points. I thank you all for a very thoughtful set of uh, comments. I think, you know, Mike raises the question of, uh, has Common Core actually already succeeded by virtue of the fact that we do now have in most states vastly improved right. standards and tests in place? And I think that's a uh, important question. And you have seen states, I think, not necessarily in response to our survey data, but uh, certainly consistent with it, sort of rebranding those standards uh, in the states um, as well. And so I think that's a, a, a useful conversation to have. I, I really liked um sort of celine and and mary catherine really say so what do we do when we see large disagreements between the teacher and public and how they're responding to these survey questions what do we make of that i think that's an essential question because at the end of the day the teachers are the street level implementers of whatever yeah. policy choices we make and so yeah. to some degree you have to take seriously their views if you want something to succeed and so i like yeah. this idea of thinking about where are the entry points for trying to uh, find a constructive role for teachers in the policy process. And I very much agree that testing, uh, sort of making sure that we have sensible policies in place, and hopefully the Every Student Succeeds Act provides an mm -hmm. opportunity to do that, uh, and merit pay uh, sort of are 
are good examples. I will say we've polled about merit pay in a couple different ways. We don't use those that specific term, merit pay. We just ask about having part of the salaries of teachers based on student learning. We've, uh, in experimental manipulations, said as measured by state tests in the past and haven't found much in the way of a difference there. Um, but we are asking about a broader concept that's very different from, frankly, sort of the current approach to teacher evaluation on these district-wide or even statewide algorithmic yeah. sort of processes where we try and have a formula that translates state it test is. results mm -hmm. and observation ratings into bonuses. And so that's where I really think there's room for um, uh, leadership on the parts of teachers. Mm -hmm. Could we find ways to make teacher compensation more flexible mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense? Of course, the key there is being comfortable with some level of subjective uh, decision-making power on the part of principals or other administrators, which has for quite some time been sort of uh, a sort of anathema to unions and mm -hmm. how they mm -hmm. approach the issue of compensation. Mm -hmm. Maybe our experience with these more formulaic evaluation systems will actually be what provides the opportunity to find a middle ground that it, that is more flexible. Um, in the past, we've cut the data on teacher experience, uh, teacher a variety of ways, especially when we've done some more combining responses across years. We have a, a book uh, with the um, provocative title "Teachers versus the Public" that um, <laughs> does that. That's certainly uh, provocative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I would say we do find some differences along party lines. I don't know that we've looked urban suburban. We and we see some patterns consistent with what you're saying with respect to experience. The question whenever you find, say, newer people having different views than older people is, is that because the profession is changing or is it because the new people yes. who disagree they with the older people are the ones yeah. who are going to leave, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I think we've been using patterns like that to predict changes in public views for a long time or teacher views for a long time mm -hmm. without necessarily seeing that translate into. Uh, and so. I think we need to think about what to make of it. Agency fees, uh, you're right. We buried that somehow in our results this year. We paid a lot of attention to it last year. For two consecutive years now, we found when we're asking the public and teachers about whether non-union members should be required to pay representation fees, that more teachers oppose that than the public. And I was very surprised by that as well until I remembered, well, who is it who's being required to make these payments? And it's teachers. Mm -hmm. So I actually think there's something uh, sort of to that that mm -hmm. actually makes sense upon reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I'll leave it there. Can I, can I say one thing on the flexibility of pay and I'll make a pitch to, mm. uh, to my union colleagues? So I think the most fascinating thing we've done at Teach Plus is work with Education Resource Strategies, which is an organization that looks at re resource allocation and helps districts to make smart decisions about resources. And they have this really great simulation. And what it does is basically says, here's a, a district budget where there are a set of different options for how you would pay teachers and how you would make other cuts that are realistically targeted to you know the size of the district and the budget that it would have. When you have teachers participate in this simulation, and we've had groups from 25 to 125 participate in it, um, it really just kind of changes the worldview of, OK, if there really are fixed costs and, and salary drives so much, then the choices we might make are different around you know, how do we you know, incentivize leadership and hybrid roles for teachers? Uh, what else would be we, we'd be willing to cut? We did this in Chicago um, when 75 schools were up to be cut. Every teacher was walked into the room against closing schools and walked out of the room for closing schools because they recognized the relationship between their own pay and school closures. And so, um, so I feel like there are opportunities for teachers to be able to be learners so that they can par better participate in the policy conversation. Well, and I was gonna, I would have just gonna jump in anyway and I would say a, a pitch is actually assigning a motivation to me without actually asking what my motivation is. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had a long conversation over over a decade, actually predating my um, my very first tenure as union president, um, in conversations about teacher pay, and I think there you know, and having negotiated several contracts and um, and finding some surprises around um, 
so, what some people may characterize as the, the staying power of a steps and lane system coming from a school district that really loves the predictability of that on their budget. Mm -hmm. And so finding that when you, when you start by um, not pitching changes, but when you start actually saying like, so what is serving you now? What are, what are some values you have around this? And so I, you know, so I listen to my school district saying, we actually need something that is predictable because our budget is tied to a state budget, which is, you know, it said that I'm like, okay, that's interesting that you need something that is predictable. And then you, um, listen to folks who first negotiated those steps and lanes because they're still alive. Um, there, are, you learn a few things from them, and you learn that steps and lanes was actually one of the most powerful um, changes to teacher pay that virtually eliminated the gap in gender pay um, in edu in the education sector. Anyway, virtually eliminated it, um, and you find okay, so having um, making sure that we do not design a system that accidentally goes back to um, paying people based on their gender more so than their um, than their actual role that sounds like an important value that's great and when you think of the the folk again when you talk to the folks who first negotiated it they actually saw in the in the absence of other measures of talent and quality and accomplishment they saw years of experience and educational attainment as ways of paying people for the merits of what they did. So they, you know, in its, in its broadest definition, those were seen as, um, as payments for accomplishments, because mm -hmm. those were the two accomplishments that were very easy to measure. And, and again, virtually eliminated gaps in, in gender. Um, and then once, um, once you saw people, once you saw the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards exist, and you saw people starting to earn National Board certification, that actually became one of the oldest modern forms of pay for accomplishments um, that enjoys wide support um, among among many people, teachers and students and and parents and uh, and administrators, and so. When you, when you start with conversations like that, it actually feels like dreaming again, as opposed to starting the conversation with, you know, with shaming people around the way they're getting paid right now. Like you adopted this old industrial, you know, dusty, um, you know, step in lane system and, you know, you should, you should know better. Like you actually, when you start with sort of like digging into like how people got there in right. the first place, again, conversations around how to pay teachers starts to feel like, feels like dreaming and feels like, a, you know, talking about accomplishments. And, and that becomes a really inviting way of talking about how I should, how I should be compensated for my skills and knowledge. Uh, so I want to throw out a question before we, we turn it over for a little bit of audience uh, Q&A. So, so one of the, the interesting things about the, the, the polls findings that jumped out to me is that teachers really aren't monolithic on a lot of these different issues. Yeah, they, they diverge from the public uh, for sure. Um, but while there are a couple of issues like merit pay and tenure where you really see you know, vast majority of teachers have a view that we think of as kind of the teacher view or the union view, there's a lot of issues where they're very split, right? Where 50% you know, of teachers support Common Core, 50 per, you know, around 50% support annual testing, tax credits, uh, charters. Um, and teachers largely are not um, uh, supportive of, of opt-out. So I'm curious, you know, particularly for organizations like AFT and Teach Plus, you know, how does AFT, which obviously has to represent all of its members, you know, think about representing all of its measures when you obviously can't come out and say we're for charters and we're against charters or we're for tax credits and we're against tax credits. And then what's sort of the role of an organization like, like Teach Plus in that, in, that, uh, in that way? Yeah, so I mean, I think it would be harder to be at the AFT in a lot of ways. You know, the group of teachers that we work with is smaller. Um, we work with a group of teachers who both self-select to us and then we then make it through our selection process as kind of proven leaders with demonstrable uh, track records with students and all in urban systems. And so, um, so there's a, a level of coherence around what we see that I think, you know, makes, makes it a little bit easier. Um, at the same time, I think um, what we're trying to do is is, is make sure that teachers are part of the moving conversation, are recognizing kind of where taxpayer interest, where um, you know resource scarcity issues come into play, and how to really like look into those issues and figure out you know how do we create a solution that is good for teachers, is good for students, and you know at the same time um, 
is re recognizes those things. So, you know, one that we have had lots and lots of teachers engaged in and, you know, when President Obama announced his new testing policy, he had two, two of our fellows standing right next to him saying, you know, like, we think testing is really important. It's the only way that we can know how we're doing with kids. And at the same time, we're in a place of being overboard and we need to make sure that we rein that back. And so, um, so that has been kind of our organizational position that has been kind of field tested with folks that we work with all around the country. I would say, I think you're absolutely right. As someone, I, I live the diversity of our thought every day. Um, and as someone who spent 10 years negotiating contracts, also knowing that there comes a point where you have to actually negotiate specific language that, you know, is held by, you know, that is in the best interest of that school community. And, and so I do understand, I have experienced it part of, you know, I think a, a large part of my job is knowing that there is this gorgeous cross-section of, of opinion and lived experience and, and thought and knowing that there are times to to move forward in advocating for one piece of that. Um, I, I can remember very briefly an experience in negotiating contracts where um, I had experimented with a new way of sharing what was happening at the contract table with our members. Um, and that was, I started to blog about it. And, um, you know, so we had various ways of like, you could like call and get the negotiating hotline and you could get your um, newsletter. And I started blogging. And um, over winter break, when people have time to like actually respond to things, um, I had four responses actually in a 36 hour period. And I don't think they were actually planned, where I had two different emails. Um, from two different members saying, gosh, I sure hope when negotiations are over, you keep blogging. This was really cool. And I had two different emails from two different members that said, if you think I'm going to go to someone's personal blog and read about negotiations, you're wrong. You know, or variations of that coming from the very same membership in my local. So, um, so this diversity thought is, is an absolute lived experience. It is why it is so important to for me to listen to educators all the time uh, when randy weingarten asked me to lead a professionalism task force to talk about the future of our profession and what professionalism should look like uh, the first thing i did was set up listening sessions wherever i could wherever i was in the country whether it was five people or 70 people i wanted to hear some questions about you know about the future of professionalism including you know, what comes to mind when you feel like you are treated like a professional in your job? Second question was, what are some barriers to feeling like a professional? And then the third was, um, what are some of the things you have already done that you could share with members that advocate for professionalism in your workplace? And those three, those three questions ended up at, you know, asking over 800 people. It made it a longer process, sure. It made it a messier process, and you could have just said, "Well, Mary Catherine, she's a National Board certifi certified teacher who has, you know, like these various teacher leadership experiences. She can just write the treatise on the future of professionalism in our um, in our workplace." Um, and and sure, but instead, spending that time, which again, it, it takes more time, it is far more worth it though because you have educators who then come to this consensus of what professionalism can mean. And it means that I might be moving one piece of that agenda, but there are threads of additional thoughts our members have on professionalism that spring out from that, that may not be the specific agenda I'm moving, but are still going to be things that impact the profession in longstanding ways. So I don't want to leave out our audience and we only have yeah. Four minutes left, so I think that's enough <laughs> for one question, or maybe two short questions with short responses. So, first hand here. Uh, uh, on Microphone. Mayor Pei seems to be, on Mayor Pei, there seems to be a discrepancy between the public view and the teacher view. Uh, it may have to do with the understanding of what Mayor Pei is or how it's interpreted by sure the thing. whoever's yeah. answering. Uh, if the question is, uh, should teachers be paid uh, based upon the proficiency of their students, of proficiency of students as tested on the state test at the end of the year, teachers may understand that that proficiency doesn't measure how good a teacher they are, but more of the demographics of the class that they're teaching. If, if merit pay means how much gain in proficiency there is 
for the students that they teach. That's a very different thing. And, and more teachers might buy into that if that was how the merit pay worked. But if merit pay is, sure. is, is, is on, I got it. Is on students they, whose performance they can't affect or can't control, Right. I, I understand. Let me jump in since we don't have much time. Uh, so the specific wording we use is, do you favor or oppose basing part of the salaries of teachers on how much their students learn? Okay, so that is exactly the interpretation that we're trying to avoid, uh, that people would say the proposal is that people be based on the level at which they're performing at the end of the year, mm -hmm. and that would clearly be unfair, and we need to make sure that we're looking at measures of learning rather than measures of achievement uh, and so and as I, I mentioned earlier we've asked about it being very explicit about as based on state tests or not without finding uh, that that influences the results either for the teachers or the broader public that being said it may be that teachers and other, uh, it may be that teachers when they hear that language do think about the cruder type of approach that you suggest or they may fear that that would be one way in which this idea would be translated from the abstract into specifics as yeah. Mary Catherine was just talking about and that could be a source of their opposition but anyways that's how we've tried to work on that it's probably interpreted as, as it is applied to them I agree I agree the and so we can yeah. just fit in one more very short question so who has anyone have a quick one uh, I think this might be a question we might want to uh, experiment with yeah because I, I, I mean I agree I think if you could ask it more about new role, you know, about taking mm -hmm. additional roles or even about some kind of, you know, for performance. If you think about a 12th grader, let's say, should a teacher be judged based on how much a 12th grader learns? I think to most Americans, they'd say, well, you're taking responsibility away from a 12th grader. That's not right. I mean, it might feel different if you're talking about a first grader. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think these things are probably very much open to interpretation. and. You know what kind of teacher you might be who you know what kind of kids you're teaching which grade level all of that goes into it. well so one of our goals for this day was to get some ideas for next year's survey mm -hmm. and uh so i think that certainly counts and i think we've got some other notes jotted down from the panel so yeah right. well, i do think that policy wonk should be paid based on the number of tweets they sent so that i'm a firm no. <laughs> well we can obviously spend another hour talking yeah, about yeah. this uh, fascinating <laughs> hit of issues and, and, and new Should data so please join me in thanking all of our <laughs> panelists for great yeah. Yeah. three tweets zero yeah zero. there you go that's more performance welcome everybody it is awesome great to be here with all the sunlight this is actually the first time i have not yet seen the hoover offices and this place is incredible uh, Fordham does not look like this, uh, but anyway, great to be here. Um, so I'm supposed to give super fast remarks because I am not a panelist, I'm a moderator. Uh, but I have just two quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Um, again, I head up uh, research at Fordham. Um, I was asked to keep these remarks really brief, but I do want to say just one thing about um, public opinion research. We've been doing these types of surveys for a while at Fordham, and usually they're pretty fun to read. That's the one thing I'll say, that it's kind of cool, right, to hear about what the public, uh, you know, thinks about the sort of some of the hot topics in education. Um, one that we did a few years ago, we surveyed Americans on school spending. We called it How Americans Would Slim Down Education. It's one of our best covers, in my opinion. It's a cover of an old schoolhouse, and he's sweating, and he's got two little legs standing out, and he's running on a treadmill, like just running really hard. And anyway, one of the most amusing findings we had in that survey is we told the survey respondents, okay, assume that education budgets are tight and that state and district leaders have have to make some tough decisions okay so just that's the assumption because most people want to say oh they want to hold on to everything you know they don't want to give up anything so we had to like put them in that situation and we gave them about I don't know a dozen different ways that they might cut public spending and the most were vehemently against uh, furlough days for teachers they didn't want to cut the year short and have teachers not be paid most of them were vehemently against reducing the numbers of non-teachers so they didn't want to see the librarian or the teacher aid go um, but the one thing overwhelmingly that they advised, which I got a big chuckle out of, was that to reduce the number of district level administrators to the very bare minimum. <laughs> so in other words, they had this idea that, you know, the district was run by these sort of fat cat bureaucrats in the district office, and they, if, if they had to cut anything, those were the ones to go. Um, so anyway, I think that, you know, that kind of stuff when you, you know, ask the public in to sort of make some of these, um, you know, thoughts and invite them in, you get some, some surprises. So 
I was struck that our Ednex analyst also had some surprises. I think we're going to hear about a few of those today. There were some uh, findings that made me chuckle a little bit as well. We're going to hear a lot about those, but um, let me just say the one thing that I personally think makes the Ednex survey unique, and I think other people have remarked about this as well, but it's that the way that they ask the same question in slightly different ways. So you can see if the opinion changes based on the public having more or less or slightly different information. And I think as consumers of research, we've intuitively known that pollsters can uh, sort of color the way that data are presented or, or you know, come out based on the way that the question is phrased. So instead of sort of ignoring that, the survey designers said, you know what, let's embrace that and let's ask these questions differently so we can actually see how public opinion changes based on the structure of the question. So they don't, you know, they don't run away um, from that assumption and that reality. So I think we actually get much richer uh, survey information out of a survey that does that than a survey uh, that doesn't. Am I still on? No, that's okay. I've got to teach. I'm a former high school teacher, so I still have my teacher voice. Um, so I'll continue to talk. Whoop, there, I'm back, I'm back. Um, anyway, I think we've seen some other surveys start to do this and try to, um, you know, change up the survey, the way the item's answered, but I think uh, the Ednex survey was pioneering in that way, so kudos for that. All right, so let's get going. Um, let me briefly introduce our panel. Of course, I'm joined by Paul Peterson, who you've already heard from today. Uh, Paul directs the Harvard Program on Education Policy and Governance at Harvard and is the editor of Chief of Education Next. He's going to give us, like Marty did, a 10-minute summary of some of the report survey findings on school choice in particular and a couple other topics. And then we've also got with us Nina Reese, who is the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. Um, with us, Shavar Jeffries, who is the president of Democrats for Education Reform, and Neil McCluskey, who is the director of the Cato Institute's Center for Educational Freedom. After Paul is finished with his overview of the survey, each panelist, again, going to have about five or so minutes to share what they found was most intriguing about the results. And then we're going to open up for Q&A. I've got a few questions in my back pocket uh, to ask these guys, and then we will open it up uh, and get your questions with our goal, really, of leaving more time than we had in the last panel uh, to get some questions from you guys. All right, so that's our run, of course. Paul, can you get us started? Thank you, Amber. Um, is the um, microphone on? Yeah, you can all hear. Um, so. Uh, we've had a big transition at Education Next, just as you have, Amber, in your life, and your name has changed, and the editor-in-chief at Education Next has changed as well. So that's the one thing about your little introduction I have to amend. I am proud to be the senior editor now, and I'm very proud and delighted that uh, Martin West has uh, assumed the responsibility of editor-in-chief as of the 1st of July, so we're in this period of transition. Um, but uh, we're here to talk about this poll. And uh, in the first panel, you heard a lot about accountability, a lot about Common Core, um, teacher policies. Now we're going to go on to uh, school choice and spending and uh, various other issues that we also talked about in the poll. Let's see if I can. I'm not going to go back over the original uh, setup that Marty covered in the first panel, other than to say this is a very large poll of over 4,000 respondents, including 700 teachers. We have the experimental design, as was mentioned by Amber, where we split the sample in half and ask one half of the sample one version of a question and the other half another version of the question, which allows us to do all kinds of uh, more probing uh, uh, kinds of uh, analyses than we could without that experimental approach uh, to survey research. So the topics I'm going to cover are school choice, uh, charters, vouchers, tax credits, grading schools, spending increases for teachers, and affirmative action. Uh, now, the, w one of the ways in which we use this experimental design research is to look at the impact that different wording of a question about vouchers can have on the actual uh, responses of individuals. And so uh, this, is, this wording we uh, started with 
when we originally began the survey back in 2007. We took it from PDK. Uh, they've abandoned this wording. They no longer even ask this question. Uh, but uh, we've kept it going. Uh, uh, a proposal has been made that would use government funds to pay the tuition of low-income students who choose to attend private schools. Would you favor or oppose this proposal? Now, I tend to call that unfriendly wording because it emphasizes using government funds to pay the tuition. Uh, and so we then introduced uh, a friendlier version in which we talked about, we connected vouchers to choice. A proposal has been made that would give low-income families with children in public schools a wider choice by allowing them to enroll their children in private schools instead with government helping to pay the tuition. They're really identical questions substantively, but they are phrased slightly differently. Now, so you can see the, the solid line is the unfriendly version of the question, and the friendly version is in the dotted lines. And the friendly version wasn't, hasn't been asked as frequently. Uh, both what questions focus on um, support for low-income families. Uh, and you can see the white line is that where the public is. So you see that big solid white line out there is uh, diving downward uh, over this time period, which shows a declining support for vouchers. And you can see that the blue line and the red line, uh, being the Republicans and the Democrats in the familiar colors, is also diving downward. And the green line, always below, but also going downward, uh, which is the one uh, that identifies teachers. Now, the dotted lines are also, uh, they're always higher. That is, the friendly question evokes a higher level of response uh, just, uh, just about across the board. And it, uh, if you look for the public as a whole, you can see that you're getting um, about 10 percentage points more support. I can't see from this long distance exactly what the difference is, but about 10 percentage points more support uh, for vouchers than the unfriendly version of the question. But you can see that there, between 2015 and 16, there was a decline in that question as well. Now. Um, if you start breaking it out by um, uh, whether or not uh, it's a white Republican, a white Democrat, an African American, or Hispanic, uh, you can see more uh, deeply into the most uh, controversial aspect of the finding in the previous line. Let me just go back to that to emphasize it. You see, the blue line is, generally speaking, above the red line in all of the, just about in every observation. Uh, so which means that, surprisingly, Democrats are more supportive of vouchers than Republicans. How can that possibly be? I mean, we, we know that Republicans love vouchers and Democrats hate that. We know that. How can this possibly be? There must be something screwy about the people at Education Next to come up with this kind of thing. What kind of a poll do they have? Anyhow, so, uh, but if you, if you zero in on that, um, you can see that it's, um, it's, it's, there is an explanation for this. And the explanation basically is, Minority families like school choice. There's a lot more support for school choice in the African American community and the Hispanic community than there is in the white community. And, and uh, you know, the differences between white Republicans and white Democrats isn't that large. Republicans are a little bit more opposed, uh, but it isn't dramatically different. Um, so, um, yeah, I think this is really the storyline. The storyline is that uh, you get a split among whites on this one, and you get overwhelmingly uh, large support uh, uh, for this uh, concept among uh, minorities. Now, then we went to, um, we altered the question. Actually, we have four variations on this question in the uh, 2016 poll because we ask exactly the same friendly and unfriendly versions, but instead of talking about low-income families, we talk about all families. And I call that universal voucher program, a voucher program for everybody. Uh, and so here is the friendly version of the uh, universal voucher plan. Uh, and here you find, generally speaking, higher levels of support 
among the public as a whole. You find especially high support among Democrats, more so than Republicans. Republicans have dropped. Teachers are opposed to this as well. So it's higher levels of support. One of the great ironies out here is, is that the school choice movement, the, the voucher campaign, has always been focused on vouchers for low-income families. The research has been always done on vouchers for low-income families. I've been part of that uh, enterprise. Uh, so there must have been somebody out there who said, politically, this is a strategic move. Let's propose vouchers for low-income families. They are going to public schools that are doing the uh, least well at serving their students. So why don't we make that the pitch? Well, it turns out that you know the public doesn't necessarily think the same way. And if you look at uh, opinion on this, it pretty much tracks what we've already said. Uh, the public as a whole, um, uh, support for it is uh, uh, greater among Democrats, white Democrats, than white Republicans. And there's especially high support in the minority community. It's not that the minority community is so selfish that they want vouchers only for themselves. It, it's true that there's less support for this among minorities, but there's still majority support in the minority community for vouchers for everybody. Uh, so that's not, that is a surprise. Is this got to be, uh, this is a surprise to me. I wouldn't have guessed this from uh, from uh, when we uh, when we began posing these questions, I, I wouldn't have expected this pattern of responses. Well, then you look at tax credits. Now, tax credits, according to some economists, are vouchers by another name. People have said that in political debates as well. I tend to agree with that point of view. A proposal that has been made uh, to offer a tax credit for individuals and corporations, corporate donations that pay for scholarships to help low-income parents send their children to private schools, would you favor that? Now, you know, do people understand the question or not? I don't know. Um, Michael Barone was suggesting that this was too abstract, and so he tried to explain away this question on those grounds. One thing I would say, this is an online survey, and when you have an online survey, people can take as much time as they want to answer that question. They can read that question three, four times if they want to. We're getting much more consistency of opinion when we use online surveys than, when we, uh, than the research that has been done using the telephone survey. So a lot of this, uh, um, uh, discussion about the public doesn't know what they're thinking, I think can be attributed in part to the difficulties of responding to questions over the telephone. And when you really ha can read the question and think about the question and respond to it, uh, you might get more consistent responses. So I tend to believe this, that the public is much more supportive of tax credits, and there's not been a significant decline in support for tax credits. So the voucher community, the school choice community, certainly has to be uh, receiving a message here that if you want to uh, promote your ideas, promote them as tax credits uh, rather than as, uh, as vouchers. Uh, now, if we turn to charter schools, I think the news here is the uh, very strong support for charter schools. Uh, we're only uh, use, giving you one uh, version of this question uh, because this is the one that really explains what a charter school is. And if you just ask people the question, do you support charter schools? I don't think that's giving people enough information in order to uh, really uh, think about, okay, what am I supporting or opposing here? And so we say, as you know, many states permit the formation of charter schools, which are publicly funded but are not, uh, but are not managed by local school boards. These schools are expected to meet promised objectives but are exempt from many state regulations. And I think that's a true statement uh, that tries to be fairly balanced and neutral in tone. So do you support or oppose the formation of charter schools? And the public by a large margin, does support this. I think that's 70 percent that we're getting there. And uh, the uh, support is particularly high among Republicans, less so for Democrats, and definitely less so for teachers. 
Uh, and it hasn't changed that much over time. I would say the, oh, the one thing that seems to be trending downwards is support among teachers and Democrats. It's tending to go upward for Republicans. And so it all sort of balances out. The only change we see is uh, between 2012 and 2013, and that's when we changed uh, the, the placement of the neutral uh, version of the question. And I, we can come back to that if you want to talk about that more. But it's my interpretation that there has not been any, uh, uh, ev there's no evidence here of, of a change in the overall level of public opinion, though you see some changes in in the shift among uh, Democrats and Republicans. Um, okay, here's the support by whites, African Americans, and Hispanics on charters. And uh, here you're seeing uh, high levels of support, uh, two to one. Uh, you know, when you put the neutral position, nothing gets over 50%. Uh, because you got a substantial segment of the population that takes the neutral position. Uh, but still, if you compare the percent support with the percent opposition, you're seeing two thirds uh, of the people who take a side on the issue are supporting um, uh, charters in all uh, ethnic groups, white, black, and Hispanic. Uh, now, if we shift the topic now to grading schools, and Michael Barone mentioned this in his talk at the beginning, uh, students are often uh, graded on an A to F scale. What if you graded schools on the same scale uh, in your local community and in the nation at large? So we ask that question uh, both ways to the same, to everybody. Everybody gets this question in both forms. This is not an experiment. This is the one case where we have two versions of a question that we give to everybody because um, that's the way it's always been done. I don't know. So we might be doing, do it as an experiment, though I don't think we get much of a difference. Um, so here we have uh, much higher levels of support for schools in your local community than the nation as a whole. Uh, PDK has found that over the years. One of the interesting things about, uh, when you compare the PDK poll to our poll, that on this question where we I ask identical questions and they use... Uh, uh, you know, somewhat, they use a different uh, uh, survey firm. Uh, the responses are is, is essentially the same. They're within a percentage point of, uh, of one another. And so that, you know, to me, that really tells uh, you basically what you also learn when you uh, read all these polls about whether Clinton is winning or Trump is winning. You know, there there's differences, but they are not very big differences. They're on the margins of two to three percentage points. And so the polling technique is very scientific. I mean, there's two aspects to polling. One is very scientific, and that is drawing a sample. One is the art form, and that is the way you ask the question. And that's why we like to emphasize that you can get different responses depending on how you ask the question. So one of the interesting things about looking at trends over time is that you're, you're asking the same question over time and anything that you're seeing, any changes you're seeing should be picking up actual changes in public opinion, which is to me the more informative thing about polling is, is opinion changing because you're asking the same questions and you can see whether or not there's a change. Well, here there is a change. You're seeing that since we began this survey, support for the, uh, people's evaluations of their local schools has gone up by 10 percentage points. I mean, that's quite a, quite a big, and, and uh, Democrats and, and Republicans and white and, and the uh, pub, uh, population as a whole, that's the white line, the red line, and the blue line, they are all so, so overlapping, you can't distinguish the one line from the other. And that all those lines are going up, and the teacher line is also going up, but not as steeply, but still decidedly. So, uh, we didn't know this, right? But maybe that's an explanation for ESSA, that people felt like, okay, you know, let's leave it up to the local schools. And so the federal government actually passed a law that says leave it up to the local schools to decide what to do. Now, I don't know if Washington's ever going to be able to stick to that, but um, there is a sentiment for that out there. And in the nation's schools, you don't see that same uh, climb in, in support. It's more flat over time and a much lower level of support of the nation's schools. How about support for more spending? Well, uh, we decided to ask people uh, how much uh, is being spent, and we wanted to find out uh, if they would change their mind 
if we told them how much was currently being spent now, because we know the respondents before we interview view them. It's not like when you call them up on the telephone cold. We know who's going to be responding to these questions before we ask the questions. So we can, we can say, okay, uh, John Jones is going to be answering this question. John Jones lives in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, what does Boston, Massachusetts spend on its schools? And then we can, uh, we'll have that information available and implanted into the survey. So they are going to be told, in your local district, uh, schools currently spend X number of dollars per pupil. Uh, so that's one of the things that you can do with an online poll. And so we wanted to find out it, it, what happens when people are actually given information about their local school district that they might not have otherwise. And they don't have it otherwise because when you straight out ask them the question, how much is being spent in your local community, they estimate about 7000 and in fact over $12,000 is being spent in local school districts. Uh, around the country in each this is the average of all the districts where the respondents lived and we can obtain that data from the US Department of Education It's available to anybody at online so anybody can find out this information just by looking it up online but the public really is you know they get 60 percent of the total uh, so now if we uh, tell them uh, exactly how much is being spent and then ask them the question do you think we should spend more we get about what is that 20 percent each points less support for increased spending um, that's the it's a little hard to see on this graph but if you compare the white line on the top graph with the white line on the bottom graph you can see that there's a much lower percentage and that's been true every year we've done this now for 10 years and we see the same pattern continually. The one change that's happened over this time period is the drop in support in 2009. Is it 2008? 2000? 2009. In 2009, there's a drop in support, uh, especially among those who are not given information. That's a reaction to the financial crisis and the a feeling that, oh my goodness, I'm going to go bust. And I not, don't want, nobody should get any more money. <laughs> <laughs> given the, but you can see it bounces right back up again among the, you know, that's, that's a one dip down back up again with, a, you know, a little bit of bouncing around uh, otherwise. Uh, and then uh, uh, among those informed is also the same thing but less pronounced. It just, uh, it's, a, it's a bouncier uh, uh, set of opinions among those not informed than those who are informed. Remember, this is a split sample. One half gets the detail information the other half does not okay how much are teachers paid same design uh, teachers uh, are actually being paid according to the national education association the average teacher in the states is being paid fifty eight thousand we have the data by state uh, or they have the data by state and we use it uh, people estimated at forty thousand uh, so you know, very substantially less. And so once again, um, when you ask this question, should teachers be paid more, you get a lot more support uh, when people do not know how much teachers are currently being paid than when they are given this information. So that's a, the two graphs really are very similar in the messages that they send. Um, okay, finally, uh, do you support or oppose federal policies that prevents schools from expelling or suspending black and Hispanic students at higher rates than other students. The Obama administration has a policy that's similar to this. They're trying to discourage local school districts. They're suggesting that they might lose their federal funding if they uh, have this po uh, policies in place that allow for the suspension of students at differential rates. Uh, so what does the public think? Well, 21% of the public supports it, 54% opposes it, 25% are neutral. Whites are quite obviously opposed, um, but uh, the support level uh, in the uh, African American community is not that high either. It's sort of the African American community is split down the middle, and uh, there's uh, 
more opposition than support in the Hispanic community uh, to this policy as well. So uh, if this were to become a public issue, it's sort of on the fringes right now, but it's moving towards the center. I suspect that um, this is going to be uh, uh, a controversial question. So that's it. And as Marty says, I don't have to do any more interpretation because I've got experts to do that for me. Uh, I'm going to be boring and go in order. So Nina, your reflections first on all these uh, findings. Thank you, Amber. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a real honor actually to be here today. I, I'm a huge fan of Education Next. We use um, the magazine and the data points you put out on a regular basis. And I'm always fascinated with some of the ideas that you put forward. And, um, and I've been a, you know, a fan of Paul Peterson and his work over the years. Um, so it's great to be up here today. Um, so very quickly, I mean, there's only good news in this poll. Um, the fact that support for charter schools has been cons consistent uh, at the national level is great for us. Um, and it, it's consistent with other polls that have been conducted on this issue. Uh, we do a poll every other other year through the Glover Park Group, and that poll also shows people like charter schools, but they actually like it more the more they learn about what, what charters are. The fact that they're public is one of the key factors that attracts people's attention and support. Uh, we also did a po poll earlier this year looking at parents' perceptions of choice and charters. Uh, we, we did this partially because every year we do a survey of um, students who are on wait lists and we're criticized because you could be on multiple wait lists. Uh, the number right now for us is about a million or so. So we decided to just go out to the uh, public and ask them, you know, do you, would you want to send your child to a charter school? And the answer by and large is yes. But what was interesting about this poll is that a lot of parents would pick a charter school even if they don't have a charter school in their community. So when you consider the fact that you are only, charters are about 6% of the market right now. Uh, the fact that so many parents, after they know what they are, would want to select them without seeing one in their community is actually very promising. That number is actually at about 70%. So w right now we estimate that um, if these choices were available, about 5 million families would want to send their children to a charter school. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough of them uh, to allow for all these families who are interested to attend or send their children to a charter school. Um, you know, the one thing I should just also highlight about the charter school movement, we celebrated our 25th anniversary this year. We now have about 6,700 charter schools around the country in 40 state, 43 states and Washington, D.C. Um, public support in all of these states is very high. Um, Three million students are currently attending public charter schools. 150,000 teachers are teaching in public charter schools. And uh, the academic achievement of low-income students, of special needs students, um, and of African American and Hispanic students is high. So every study that's been done, every randomized field trial or high quality study that's been done consistently shows that these subgroups do better in a charter school. Um, so we have a lot going for us. And so when, um, you know, when confronted with criticism, I should also just point out that when you have such a constituency that's been around now for 25 years in so many places, um, unlike other reforms that have come and gone, like Common Core, No Child Left Behind, where you didn't have a base of support or a natural organic constituency, this one has people who have you know, gone to a charter school. A lot of students have now graduated from charter school. So you actually have a lot of uh, people who are consumers of charter schools. So I don't think that uh, the opposition can really erode this support if they were to you know, really oppose the movement. Um, but having said that, um, defending what you have is, of course, much easier than proactively pushing forward. So in many of the states where we are trying to expand the growth of charter schools, like in Massachusetts, where there's a ballot initiative uh, at play this November, that's when it gets a little bit more difficult. So when, when you're trying to expand the opposition, um, flexes its muscles, and in, it's, it's really in those instances where we have to see if our movement is strong enough or if the support is strong enough to be able to push forward and fight kind of some, some of those last remaining things that remain in our, uh, it, you know, remain to be won uh, in the growth of charter schools. And those things are 
greater funding. We still get only about 70 cents of every dollar that follows students to um, traditional public schools. Facilities, uh, charter schools don't come with their own school buildings. They have to use operating dollars to lease or rent or purchase a school building unless they get philanthropic support, unless you're in New York City um, and in a few other places. And, um, and then autonomy, making sure that um, charters um, you know, the grand bargain of chartering is more autonomy in exchange for, um, uh, for results. And so over the years, we've also noticed that in many states, um, uh, in the quest to make sure that we get chartering right, there's been increased, um, you know, increased rules and regulations in place, uh, which, which may potentially discourage newcomers to enter the space. So, um, so we think, you know, this, this poll points in the right direction. Um, but again, the challenge or the opportunity for us is to turn the 60 some odd percent who support charters into advocates for charters, or at least in those places where you have <coughs> fights, really turn those individuals into people who are actually um, pushing for the growth of charter schools. So. Uh, good morning. Very happy to be here um, also. Um, the results for us, too, are very consistent with what our experience is of what our experience is with working with families throughout the country, uh, what our experience is supporting Democrats throughout the country who believe in uh, alternatives for, for young people. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I thought it was also very interesting uh, in the polls findings that it showed that Democrats not only support charters uh, with a solid majority, but also support voucher programs as well, and that the voucher support within the Democratic Party has actually gone up uh, in, in recent times. So I thought that was interesting as well. But again, it's also not a surprise uh, to me at all, uh, you know, particularly when we talk about families of color. We have many families of color in cities, and I think it's also important to differentiate uh, low-income families of color from middle and upper middle class. I mean, I saw some of the data that, that um, uh, spoke about low-income families and racial minorities in a way that didn't necessarily be clear that there's a, there's a huge black middle class that we, have to be, that we have to keep track of. I hear a little echo, is that, are we okay? Um, but that said, uh, in the cities where you have many, we have a disproportionate number of low-income families of color, uh, we've had schools that have been underperforming for a long time. And so it's not a surprise uh, to me at all uh, that we see significant majorities of low-income families of color uh, in those cities who want, uh, who want alternatives. And what we see in the political conversation, which is a large part of the work that we do at Democrats for Education Reform, is what we see in a variety of, of other domains, which is it's not that, that, that difficult for a well-financed, highly organized, relatively small number of people to capture the politics of any particular issue. So we see this sort of regulatory capture on a whole range of issues. I'd argue on issues like gun control, we see a similar sort of dynamic. And so we have um, uh, certain interests you know, rooted in the teachers' unions and their allies uh, that have fought for a long period of time to do many things that have been very positive in terms of better working conditions for teachers and better pay for teachers and uh, better professional development for teachers, but have also done some things that are problematic not only for the young people who are served by these schools, but also by teachers themselves, because it all, in, in many ways, uh, some of the practices that, um, that we've seen that have been in, in opposition to innovation uh, treat educators like widgets as opposed to the highly talented professionals that they, that they are. But in any case, they've leveraged their resources very well, uh, which shouldn't be a surprise, because that's what political interest groups do every day. Uh, they've leveraged their membership very well. They leverage how organized they are very well. They've leveraged political money very well. They've leveraged the fact that the teacher is a beautiful brand, right? That's a beautiful brand to say you're a teacher and you're fighting for kids and you have a certain set of ideas about what's the best way to educate kids. Uh, parents and families are, are predisposed to want to trust and respect uh, their teachers because their teachers are taking care of their babies uh, every day. And so they and they also have uh, a tremendous political asset that on each of those domains, organization, mobilizing votes, supporting candidates, political money, uh, in the comms domain as well, as well, they've been doing it for a long time. And so you build up trust when you've been engaged in certain activities for a long period of time with the same people. So whether there's local clergy, whether there's local elected officials, uh, whether it's local 
uh, civic association uh, 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 groups, uh, where there's local advocacy groups. When you've been there 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years, helping the pastor with the book bag drive, helping the local uh, civic organization with fundraising drives, uh, helping council people get elected, helping school board members get elected, helping mayors get elected, then it's not a surprise uh, when you have uh, a set of ideas that you're very much opposed to including choice uh, and other innovations as well um, and, and standards and accountability, it's not a surprise you leverage that political influence to great effect. And there's disproportionate influence in the teachers' union in the, in the Democratic Party, and that's what we're here uh, to counteract. So I say all that to say that the poll results are not a surprise to us. They're very consistent with polling that, that others in our sector have done, that we've done uh, ourselves. We did a poll with the Benenson Group last year, uh, which showed numbers very similar to this in terms of support for uh, uh, par parental choice within a Democratic Party, uh, support for parental choice uh, among families of color. Uh, our, our goal, our project, is to translate the fact that families and, and, and that there's a broad consensus around these ideas into policy change, and that means we have to change the political environment uh, through which uh, these policies uh, vindicate themselves. So in any case, I look forward to the Q&A, uh, 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 and I'm very, very happy to be here. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Ed Nix and Hoover for having me today. Uh, we're all supposed to be talking about school choice, but I did want to mention something else. Um, we were talking about Common Core earlier. Mike Petrilli sent out a tweet saying that I hadn't gotten enough credit for the demise of Common Core popularity. So <laughs> since you're looking for questions for the next iteration of the poll, make sure you put in a question of how big was Neil McCluskey's impact uh, on the demise of Common Core. Um, moving on from there, though, I just had three things I wanted to kind of focus on about what's in the poll, and then again, maybe a suggestion for, for something that could go into school choice messaging, but also uh, be in, in future uh, Ednex polls. Uh, the first thing that I think is important to look at is this question of universality. Uh, clearly, uh, universality, uh, as we've seen, uh, gets more popular support. Um, and I think that's sort of natural. If people feel like they are all going to potentially benefit from a policy, they are likely to support it. I think one thing, a problem that, that school choice has had is that the focus has certainly been on people who are in the worst schools that have the biggest educational problems, but it's very hard to build a big enough constituency to support school choice if most people think, well, that's not for me, and if they also see it as an additional drain coming from their tax dollars, which is why the government funding portion of those questions uh, is important. So I think it's, for one thing, good strategy in the school choice community to, to move more and more to a discussion of universality, everybody getting school choice. Uh, more importantly, though, I think it's the right thing to do. I think ultimately what we want to move to is make education sort of like well, consumer electronics, make it an actual marketplace, actually based in freedom. And that gives you the competition you need, that spurs innovation, and it gives, you, gives lots of schools the ability to specialize in the needs of unique kids. And all kids are different. They want different things out of schools. They have different skills, abilities, strengths, weaknesses. And we really want to go to an education system that is built around individuals and individual communities, individual children, and that means universal school choice. So I think it's both sort of st strategically the right thing to talk about, but I think it's also what we should be moving in because that's the right thing educationally for everyone. Um, I think that the second thing I want to talk just very briefly about is scholarship tax credits. Uh, and in part because scholarship tax credits seem to be, if you, if you get rid of the neutral answers, the, they are the most popular form of choice. Now part of that could be, as we've talked about, maybe people don't quite understand what they are. Um, that could be part of it, but I think it also sort of hooks in to why universality is, is something that's popular, is that with the tax credits, everybody feels like they may get some benefit out of it. So you may be a recipient of a scholarship that's funded this way, and that's great, then you get school choice. But I think families and other people can say, well, look, maybe my company, maybe I personally on my taxes, I can also get a credit because I am donating. It seems to have more benefit for everyone, and I think that's important. Uh, it's also why I think we've seen school choice, private school choice, delivered uh, 
more kids are going to private schools as a result of scholarship tax credits than traditional voucher programs. Uh, last year, there were 230,000 kids roughly going to private schools with a tax credit funded scholarship versus about 150,000 kids um, who are using a voucher. And I think it tends to have uh, more universal appeal. And actually, even if you, if you just if you get rid of the, the neutral people, it even has a little more support on this than charter schools do. And that may also be because people may who understand charter schools, or at least they might get a sense, well, charter schools, again, are something other people can get, but I can't, whereas everybody may think they can at least get the tax credit. Uh, and then finally, again, talking about messaging, but also talking about what education is about, which I think sort of fits in with the bigger debate we've had about education in the last several years is we have message school choice and education reform generally as this is what's going to get us better test scores. But I do think you've had some public response, maybe it's not the majority, maybe it's a loud minority, but a lot of people saying education is not just about test scores, and we reject that. And I think that's also something we need to be saying in school choice is, you want school choice not just because you think it might get you higher test scores, but because it enables you to access the, an education you think is best for your kids, which may be about the academic program. It may be about the values that the school teaches. It may be you want to just avoid bad values or bad curricula that you don't like. But I think we need to much more talk about how educate how school choice fits in with a free society in which we want to empower individuals um, and not just say we want better test scores. And I think it's also important to recognize that school choice can, and I think the evidence is does, provide better test scores, but we have a big problem with that it doesn't do it very quickly and it doesn't do it very clearly if what we're talking about is every year test score results come out in your state and you see like we saw in Alabama yesterday where, well, what we'll do is we'll just pull the, the private school kids who are using a voucher and say, well, their test scores are below the national average or the state average, therefore we know school choice is no good. And of course that's not based on growth, that doesn't anything, do anything to control where the kids were to begin with, but it's so easy to just cherry pick test scores and say school choice doesn't work. Um, and so I think, again, for strategy and because it's better educationally, we need to start moving away from a focus just on school choice is going to get you better academic outcomes, to saying school choice is going to give you what you want out of education, which leads to my, my other recommendation for what may be added to future um, iterations of this poll, which is Terry Moe at back in 2001, and maybe he's done it subsequent to that, but uh, he and his big book on, on lots of uh, analyzing uh, the poll results, survey results on education, found something called what he called a public schooling ideology, where basically he asked three questions that more or less all said, you know, even if your public schools are doing a terrible job, would you support them? And you get a third of the people saying, yes, even if they're doing an awful job, my job is to support these. You got about a third of people said, I would feel it's morally wrong to send my children to private schools. And it would be interesting to see how much people feel attached to their public schools based not necessarily on the test scores they're getting, but a feeling about public schooling as potentially some sort of institution that has to be preserved no matter how well or how poorly it does. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to kick us off with a question, uh, and then I'll open it up. And then if you guys don't have enough questions, I'll come back to mine. Uh, my first one's for Shavar. Um, if you're living under a rock, uh, maybe you didn't know this, but I think the rest of us do, um, that the NAACP recently issued a statement uh, calling for a moratorium on charter schools. These data here show us that charter school support has remained stable roughly since 2013. We see about 74% of Republicans backing charters uh, and just 58%, so lower, of Democrats. So when the letter came out, the statement came out from the NAACP, Shavar, you wrote your own statement in response, uh, part of which you said you'd be happy to work with the NAACP to sanction or shut down low-performing or traditional schools that segregate as well as charter schools. Uh, so I'd like to know if you could expand a bit on how you see the differences of opinion on ch school choice within the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, you know, the Democratic Party, um, just like the African-American community <clears throat> in the Constitution of NAACP, is, is a big, diverse coalition of a lot of different people uh, with a lot of different interests. I think this data shows that uh, a strong majority of, of Democrats support 
uh, public charter schools. It shows that a, a strong majority of African Americans and Hispanics as well uh, support public charter schools. We strongly disagree with the NAACP, have the utmost respect for the NAACP. The end up, uh, folk of color stand on the back of the NAACP in terms of the work they've done for 70, 80 years to bring more equity uh, to our country, to bring more equity to our public schools, uh, to dismantle a system of segregation where black folk couldn't even go to certain schools because they were born with a certain color of skin. So I have the utmost respect uh, for the NAACP. We just strongly disagree on this particular issue. Um, and we express that. And we also express the fact that for us, this really isn't, it's ideological, but it's really fundamentally practical. Whatever works for children, we support. So there's charters that don't work, close them. If traditional public schools, if they're doing a great job for kids, expand them, support them. And so just like we said, if there are pub public charter schools that are not doing a good job for kids, we'd work with anybody uh, to hold them accountable. Uh, we also would love to work with NAACP to maybe impose a moratoria on schools where only one in ten children can read on grade level. Uh, in cities throughout the country, uh, particularly my own uh, in Newark, New Jersey. So if they want to uh, entertain a moratorium on that, we would we would love to, to explore that with them. In terms of the broader Democratic Party, it's similar to what I talked about before. Um, the teachers union is a very strong interest group. And again, they've earned the right to be a strong interest group because they pool their resources, they work together, they collaborate on things they, they care about. So I don't say that others might put that in a more pejorative way. They're fighting for what they believe in. And teachers ought to have the right to organize and fight for what they believe in. We believe deeply in collective bargaining, uh, and we believe in their right to organize. But somebody has to fight for these children. And unfortunately, children don't have unions. And so, uh, but the unions have leveraged their, their influence and their political strength uh, to obtain many policies that we think are bad for kids and bad for teachers. And that, and part of the debate in the Democratic Party is connected to that. So we see in the poll data, as we've seen before, large majority of Democrats support many of the, these ideas. Uh, but we don't often see that vindicated sustainably in public policy because of the strength, frankly, of the teachers unions and, and groups allied to them. And so that's going to be a big fight we have. Before I shut up, I do got to say one thing. I can think of, of a lot of metaphors in terms of what I'd like to see for public education. To be frank, consumer electronics <laughs> would be the last one I would put in terms of wanting, wanting the education sector to look like consumer electronics. So I just wanted to be clear about that. But uh, <laughs> I think there's some other metaphors that, that I personally would think would be more apt. But that's, that's just my view. All right. Let me open it up to you guys, see what we've got out there. I uh, think, do we have a microphone we're going to circulate, or are we just going to be, okay, got one here right here. Yes, sir. Uh, speak loudly, identify yourself, and just make sure that uh, you get to your question quickly. Thanks. Uh, Jason Russell with the Washington Examiner. I wanted to ask about uh, the school voucher questions in the poll, because uh, they did ask multiple versions of that question, but I thought it was interesting that none of them actually used the term school voucher. Um, so I'm wondering if you think that school vouchers have a similar branding problem that Common Core has. You know, if they had asked, what do you think of school vouchers, and put it bluntly like that, would how much would have support have dropped for that, uh, particularly among Democrats, do you think support would have dropped a lot? That's a good question. I, I think that's such a good question. I'm tempted to try to come up with the answer next year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all we're getting. <laughs> No more takers on that one. Uh, what else? We got other questions out there? Yes, sir. We got one in the back here. A microphone's headed your way. Hi, uh, James Paul with the Commonwealth Foundation based in Pennsylvania. Uh, curious about uh, Neil's point on universality. Uh, one thing that I've noticed, at least in Pennsylvania, is that lawmakers tend to favor programs that are targeted and have a specific smaller constituency that will rally behind a program. The public, at least from this poll and others, uh, indicates that universal programs are more popular. So I'm curious if, if anyone um, on the panel has any thoughts about kind of squaring those competing uh, diverging preferences. Uh, I'll just give you an, uh, my thought on why lawmakers may not like it is because most people don't talk about it. So it's not like they're presented with a public that says, we all want school choice, because the school choice we've talked about for so long has been targeted. My suspicion is uh, if we started to really uh, promote universal voucher programs, you'd see a lot more 
public response saying we want them, and then legislators may have to respond to that. Where you may see a beginning of this is in Nevada, where they had a big ESA program, or Indiana's got a pretty big voucher program. And I think, I, I haven't looked, but I think you might see a lot more popular pressure on legislators in those states to say, yeah, we want universal programs, and they would have to respond to that. But in most places, until recently, we haven't really talked about broad, basically universal programs. Let me follow up on that, because, I mean, this was one of the big surprises, Paul, right, that more Democrats and Republicans were supporting vouchers. So, Neil, what do you make of that? Uh, again, I, I, would, I would think some of it is because... Um, most people haven't even thought about this idea of universality. Mm -hmm. But I also think, and I probably most people would agree with this, Republicans tend to have chosen districts by cho choosing houses, and they're happy with the public schools they have. Mm -hmm. And they tend to also think, you know, public schooling's working for us. Uh, you know, we go, to, we go to Friday football, and the kids are in honor society, and why would anybody want anything different? Although PDK used to ask a question a long mm -hmm. time ago that said, if you could get a voucher to go to a private school, that had very high support. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is they don't think of anything other than their public schools. I think that's traditional America. I think that's probably linked into this public schooling ideology of if we didn't have public schools, everything would fall apart. Mm -hmm. But when it gets specific and they think, well, boy, what if I could choose the private school that I don't want to pay for right now, but someone helped mm -hmm. me pay for it, that changes it. And Republicans right now are happier with the status quo. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir, we got a microphone is headed here. Uh, a question about the uh, uh, voucher questions. Uh, in informal conversation, uh, much of the opposition to vouchers is related to parochial schools as a subset of private schools. In asking these questions, have you ever identified parochial schools as part of the recipient group. Uh, I'm wondering if that might make a difference in the results. No, we haven't. Uh, the only two versions of the question, well, we've asked four versions of the questions over the years, and uh, you've seen them all up there on the screen. Uh, but it's an interesting thought. You might see whether that would make a difference. I, I tend to think that people know that private schools tend to be religious schools. Almost all private schools are religious schools. The number of, sec uh, the number of students who go to private schools that are going to secular private schools is probably about 10 percent. I mean, 50 percent are Catholic schools, uh, 30 percent are uh, what are called Christian schools, and uh, 10, you know, there's a, another 10 percent of other, uh, re, there's some Jewish schools, there's some Lutheran schools, there's some Episcopalian schools, there's some, you know, other uh, religious groups have their private schools. And, you know, then there's a few secular schools out there. Uh, but, you know, we got private education in the United States because churches wanted to provide education for their con constituents. and. And that's why we have private schools. So I'm not sure you would get a lot of difference if you asked about uh, parochial schools or religious schools in the responses. But it's, it's something we could consider. All right. Right here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Jim Sabalka. I have a question about um, your thoughts on why public support for local schools has been going up, I think Paul said, by about 10%. Now, if we look at the national, the NAEP data, that wouldn't seem to um, indicate uh, evidence for an increased public confidence. Is this a holdover from NCLB, where we had a lot of faulty state and local level data about performance. What is your hunch as to what's behind this? Well, nice to see you, Jim. Uh, and 
It's a good question, and I wish I could be sure of my response, but my guess is that it's a reaction against the nationalization of our educational system, that, that people are, are beginning to identify with their local institutions. I think Michael Barone talked about that in his opening remarks uh, today, that people are sort of retreating from national issues and thinking more about uh, local institutions. And that's, that's a possibility. And it, if you look at ESSA, the new federal education law, it sort of puts that feeling into, into print. Now, what's going to actually happen with ESSA is now under a lot of debate. But certainly, uh, it was, the animation for it was on, from both sides of the aisle. Republicans and Democrats alike seem to want to turn things back to the states and the localities. And they may be sensing what this public opinion is out there better than, uh, than we can. That's their job, to, to figure out what's on the minds of uh, ordinary people. And so that's sort of what I think is going on. I think this question's for Paul, too. I'm John Vallant from the Brookings Institution. Um, so I think it's, it's really nice and it's really interesting to be able to track changes in what the public thinks about particular issues over time. What's harder for me to pick up is which issues the public cares the most about. So to what extent they care about Common Core versus charter schools versus test-based accountability. Do you have a way, and I'm thinking about this sort of in the context of a presidential election in which we haven't heard much about K-12 and which issues might actually come up because people do care about them. Have you cut, have you cut the data in a way to look at that or do you have sort of a way of thinking about that, about what really is on people's minds? Um, the best uh, clue would be the uh, percentage that take that neutral response. So one of the things that we could do or anybody could do once to explore that topic, because that data is all up online, uh, you can look at it yourselves, is take a look at that neutral response. And if you see a question uh, and you see a lot of people picking, uh, I don't either support or oppose it, that's a hint that people don't know. For example, uh, we add asked two charter school questions. And one of the questions was, do you support charter schools? Well, I didn't present that today. I probably should have. But uh, I didn't because the percentage choosing that neutral response is very large. And so I think, you know, when, unless you give the respondents some kind of a context, they're not going to know what that charter school is. I think we found in previous surveys that a lot of people have misperceptions of what a charter school is. Some people think they teach religion at charter schools. Other people think they exclude people from applying to charter schools. Or, so there's a lot of uh, misinformation that people have in their heads. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, you, you do have to remember that public opinion uh, can fluctuate depending on the information that they have. And, um, uh, especially if they don't pay much attention to this particular issue. And a lot of kids, you know, most people do not have children. The number of, in school, the percentage of the population that has a child in school at the time that the survey is being asked is about, what, 20, 25 percent? What, what is it, Nina? Oh, I don't know. I think, I think, <laughs> I think it's about that. It's roughly 20, 25 percent, yeah. We, you know, we, we've done polls, and, and I don't know if this is something that could be folded in, where we'll ask respondents to, to rank issues. And, and we consistently um, find, and again, we, our poll, I'm sure, doesn't have the full scope of, of what uh, Education Next has done. But we find jobs people care about first and foremost. Um, in, in a lot of the cities where we do work, safety uh, and security, uh, and then schools uh, next. Um, but, but again, that's just our, the, the handful of polls we've done on this. Uh, but that could be something that could be thought about is asking people to, to specifically rank, you know, how they weight education versus other issues. To what extent are they, do they be, will they vote on the education issue, um, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe I could just add one thing that's a really helpful suggestion because other polls have looked at that question. And if you look at uh, what's important to you in this election, the issues that come up first have to do with the economy and foreign policy, taxes, uh, and then health care and education come in pretty much uh, equal. So once you get away from the obvious uh, major issues that dominate uh, public life, uh, 
health care and education are very much on the minds of the American public. Good. Any other questions out there? You guys are pretty good, smart audience. I'm liking these questions. What else is lurking out there? All right, I'll throw one of mine in while you're thinking. Uh, uh, this one's for you, Nina. So we saw, again, that we had stable support for charter schools. Um, and I guess my question is, you know, some of us might think that might be higher, right? We're continuing to see the number of charter schools grow. Um, so I guess what do you see as the biggest imperative uh, that we need to be working on to make sure that this public opinion doesn't erode or it even expands? Um, so that's a great question. One of the things that uh, we paid a lot of attention to in looking at the polls is also the fact that opposition is only at 15% and mm -hmm. it has remained at 15% over the years. And um, we're kind of at a point where that opposition is becoming louder. We did an analysis last year looking at the conversation about charters on social media, and we discovered that for every positive impression on social, there were at least three to four negative posts. Um, and um, But this conversation is also happening very much in a bubble, mm -hmm. and uh, it's important for us not to overreact to the negativity, but there is a danger that the negative news will seep into the kind of general media streams, and it has happened a few times over the past year. So um, I think we need to pay attention to it, but I don't think that it's enough cause for concern. Um, having said that, again, going back to Massachusetts, I was hoping Chavar would address this issue. I mean, so what's happened in Massachusetts very quickly, because there is a ballot initiative to lift the cap on charters in Massachusetts, one of the things that's really interesting to me is that the Democrat Party in Mass has opposed the initiative, but when you poll the Democrat in Massachusetts, the support is overwhelmingly positive. And one of the tactics that the opposition is using is basically saying that charters take millions of dollars out of public schools. And so how are we able, I mean, it's, it's negative advertising, uh, and our messages so far, to the best of my knowledge, have remained very positive. So, um, you know, we tend to be you know, nice people. Our, most of our educators are in this business because they want to truly offer a, a high quality education for their students. They're not political creatures, but these fights are being fought in a political domain. Uh, and so how, how quick are we to mobilize our folks to also fight back is going to be really imperative in places where we, we do want to expand. So it's, again, different when you want to defend in Washington state where we were defending uh, the law, we were able to succeed. We had the faces and the voices of the movement. Uh, but when it comes t time to actually expanding, and in this case, a very blue state, unionized state, it's, it's difficult to know if we'll be able to actually win the votes and get our folks to show up at the same rates uh, as the unions are going to get their teachers to show up. No, no I mean, that the, I mean the, 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 you know, the teachers' unions, um, and again, we also differentiate because we we do work with teachers unions where we can, but we also work with other unions too. And it's very important to differentiate because they have very different interests when you look at some of the teachers unions versus other public sector unions versus private sector unions. Um, but uh, in any case, they're very vertically integrated, right? So when they want to move, they can move together fast, right? Their money is integrated. They don't got to go run to thousands of people all over the country and ask them to write a check. Their members are integrated. They want to mobilize X number of people to show up at a rally. They're right there, and they have their affiliates, and they're all integrated. Um, they have a comm shop integrated, right? So they can move together. And the education reform landscape first uh, many people who support every form are coming very recently to understand you have to you have to you have to act politically because as Nina said people set up schools they want to set up CMOs they want to be teachers didn't want to deal with politics but you have to because these are public institutions so so people are just over the last few years really taking it to the next level mm -hmm. but then the other problem we have is very disaggregated all you know so many different groups all over the place um, you know, have to raise money from all sorts of different people, right? So it's just very diluted, it's very dispersed. And we're dealing with an opposition that's not only integrated now, has been integrated for a long period of time, mm -hmm. right? And so, so that means we have a lot of big political fights. That doesn't mean we can't overcome them, because we will, because right is on our side and these ideas are the right ones. Uh, but it means we're gonna have a lot of challenges along the way. You know, Massachusetts is a very unionized state, very blue state. Uh, you know, many legislators throughout the whole state, uh, they don't win their elections without, without union support. And so we're doing work there, we're involved in this, in this fight. The other challenge there was a Republican who was leading the cap lift, 
right? So when you have a Republican leading the cap lift in a presidential year in a heavily unionized blue state, guess what? <laughs> Right. It's not that. And and to be and so we we were able to to get involved uh, more recently because, we, you know, we had to get some stakeholders to understand that you need to have a Democratic led fight. But frankly, by the time and, and this is this gets to my integration point, you have to move fast and it's hard to move fast. If you're not integrated and it's hard to move fast if you have to go get resources and go get people and coordinate with 35 different people before you can move. And while you're doing that, your opposition is kicking your butt. Mm -hmm. And so we have we have to you know we have to make adjustments in our sector so we can move faster and move more efficiently and be smarter too, right? Be smarter about the messengers we use, right? You know, be smarter with people who really care about the issue to say, you know what, maybe you shouldn't be the one out in front if we really want to get to the goal. I know you may like to and it may feel good for your ego. You shouldn't do that, right? Especially trying to go to certain types of communities to build support. Let's let's send the messenger who's most likely to be able to generate the support. So we're doing that. And I, and I think the future is ours because, again, these issues are right. These babies need what it is that we offer. Uh, we just it's, it's really on us now. It's really on us who believe in these issues uh, to get smarter politically, to figure out ways to collaborate and coordinate, to integrate better so we can move quicker and faster. Um, and that'll take time, but we'll get there. Good. Uh, I've got six minutes, according to my watch. So another question. See one in the back. Yes. I'm Diane Pichet with the National Coalition of Diverse Charter Schools. Uh, it seems to me that this particular issue, particularly in Massachusetts, is not unlike other political issues where moneyed interests prevail or could prevail over the majority of voters or, or uh, constituents impacted. Um, so like gun control comes to mind. Um, and, and you know, there are plenty of others, but in this particular context, can we learn anything from uh, public opinion versus uh, moneyed interests and how to leverage public opinion against the moneyed interests of the teachers unions? Yeah, my, my view is the way we overcome that is through the people, right? Mobilizing the families and the con communities uh, who benefit from these schools. I think that's foundational. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, uh, I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and, and I've done a lot of education reform work in, New in Newark for 16 years. I founded the KIPP, I was the founding board president of KIPP schools in Newark. Uh, I was on the traditional school board there, I ran for mayor there, been a civil rights attorney there for a long period of time. Um, it, wasn't, it's not, it, has, it wasn't until very recently that folks thought it was actually smart to organize and mobilize the families to fight for these schools. Uh, we had, frankly, rooms that looked like this, where folks came up with ideas about what was best for kids and connected to people who had the money and just said, let's go do them, right? And I believe most of these ideas are great for kids, right? So I'd be the same person in the poll saying that's good. But guess what? In a democracy, you actually got to go persuade parents and families that these ideas are the right ones because these are their children. And we didn't do a good enough job of doing that. And so that means not, it's not just the money. It's, and, and frankly, I, I would argue even more important than the union money is the respect and trust they've built through decades of engaging these very same communities that many of us didn't until very recently. Right? So you have trust and respect. And then you also get what I call like cognitive capture and that people get in an echo chamber, unfortunately, too often in our country where you're just listening and talking to the same people over and over again. So if you've been doing that, it's not just because the union person may have given you a check every time you run for office or you run a local NAACP and they've given you a check. You then believe that stuff because the people you associate with say a lot of the same things. And so, so to, to, to me, how we overcome this and I'm not sure if this is rude in the poll or not, but I know this is true, is how we, how we overcome this is go to these families and communities and say the same, you believe this, and the poll shows you believe this, now you have to become a political actor and act based upon what you believe. So it's not just enough to fill out a piece of paper on, or to fill out something online or to respond to a survey. You have to go organize. You got to go knock on doors. You got to write, I don't care if you only got $20, write that $20 ch um, check to somebody who's supporting you. You got to take election day off and pull votes out, right? After the election, when, when the charter cap lift comes up. You got to vote for that. You got to tell your neighbors to vote for that. We have to do that because the average person who's, who's saying, yes, I support these ideas, they're probably working a job and a half. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to, you know, deal with issues in their life, right? So we have to let them know if you really care about this, you have to become a political actor. And that's where we're going, but we're not there yet. And 
just very quickly, Diana, actually, I love um, the mission of your organization, and hopefully we can work more closely together to solve this problem. I think one of the problems we have, as was brought up at, by the questioner earlier, is that our movement is very much right now because legislators wanted to have quick victories in those places where the need was greater, greatest. Most of our students and most of our political base is in inner cities. In order for us to be able to really expand, we do need to branch out into middle and upper income neighborhoods, because once you have these charter schools in those neighborhoods, as you see in places like Arizona through um, bases and great hearts, then you see a very different dynamic when it comes to defending and seeking to expand charter schools. So I would say at the same time that we're making the case for social justice and making sure that students in low-income communities uh, get access to a high-quality school, that we should also in tandem pretty aggressively try to also expand charter schools in, you know, regular neighborhoods so that you can expand that political base and all of a sudden you'll see these dynamics change pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a point you made earlier, Neil, and, and you know, Rick has made this point many times over the years when you see data like we've seen today where most people are happy with their public schools uh, and they're happy with their kids' schools. It's kind of hard to kind of invest them in the idea of, you know, schools that are for, for these other kids, right, because it doesn't impact them. Be. Right. Yeah. Ironically, they shouldn't be because the average we did, we mm -hmm. PRN did a study that was in the New York Times uh, in the spring that uh, the average white kid in the suburbs and the rural uh, environment, they're not ready for the global economy. So they're just right. in this false Shangri-La. And so there needs to be a, an effort there right. as well. They may be doing better than some of the kids in the hood, but they're not ready for the global economy. Right. That's right. All right. I've got noon. Please join me in welcoming this great panel. Uh, thanking this great panel. <laughs> we're done welcoming, we're thanking. Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. I hope you uh, sp consider this time well spent. And uh, thanks. Uh, hopefully you'll come back for the next Hoover event. Thank you. <laughs>